Is that better? Oh, there we go. Okay. Here we go. Uh, so, right now you can see a slide with information about the Menti code, and uh, that will come handy throughout the day. Uh, so, you can already put in the code, and then uh, the presenter will let you know when it's going to be used. So, with that said, I move forward and uh, welcome you to today's uh, today's agenda. And I think I press once more. Let's let's stop here. So, dear colleagues and friends, uh, a warm welcome to day two of the Open Science for. Um, the policy to practice. And this conference is associated with the Swedish presidency of the Council of the European Union. And the three main organizers are the National Ri Library of Sweden, the Swedish Research Council, and the Swedish Museum of Natural History. However, there is a large group of organizations that has made these two days possible. And I would like to start the day by just mentioning them all. So these organizations include the European Commission of Joint Research Center, the Swedish Higher Education Institutions, the European Network of Science Centers and Museums, Euroscience, the Swedish National Commission for UNESCO, the Swedish Science Centers, Stockholm University Baltic Sea Center, Young Academia, uh, or Young Acad Academy of Sweden, I should say. Uh, and last but not least, the organization actually kept all these organizations together, and that is public and science. And I also like to take the opportunity to thank uh, Riksbankens Jubileumsfond for their financial support. And as you just heard, we are quite a diverse group that has put together this conference. And that is also mimicked in uh, the composition of the delegates attending the conference. The speakers come from eight different countries. And the delegates come from 19 different countries. I find this amazing. And we're both here on site and digitally. Um, so, as the director of the Swedish Museum of National History, I would uh, uh, especially welcome you to the site of today's conference, which is the museum. And we know from experience that, oops, that most people uh, think about our wide-ranging public activities when they hear about the museum. Uh, we have about 600,000 visitors yearly, and we are the most vid di uh, digitally visited museum in Sweden. Uh, so public activis activities are extremely important if we want to aim for society that is based on a foundation of scientific knowledge and uh, shared values. Uh, and the position of the museum is to be the research museum. And this is uh, to highlight the legacy of the museum as a research institution. This diagram reflects the distribution of resources at the museum between the research and collections and uh, public engagement. So the fact that more than three quarters of our resources are put towards research and collections and that we publish about 250 scientific papers each year come as a surprise to many people. So with that said, I hope you feel that we are the right place for today's uh, discussion. Uh, and the theme of today is embedding open science in society. And we will do this divided into three different parts, as you can see here on, on the slide. And I hope you'll be able to stay the full day. Because in the end, we have something very special to look forward to. We will actually be visited by uh, the Ministry for Culture, Parisa Liljestrand, and we are very happy to, to welcome her to the conference and see and listen to her uh, perspectives on this subject. 
Um, before I, I give the floor to the first uh, session of the day, I just want to welcome you to a guided tour in the museum. So if you're here on site and you have a little bit of more time to, uh, to spend, uh, please uh, join us for the guided tours. Okay, let's see what happens now. Oh. Yes, so science for policy making. I would like to invite uh, Agnieszka Gadzina Kolodnieska, Deputy Head of UNIT, European Commission Joint Research Center, uh, to the States. Welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a true pleasure to be here in Stockholm to discuss with you science for policy. Uh, we hear all around yesterday, we will be still discussing today how important science is for society. Let me bring it a level uh, more, how important the science is actually for our democracies and the resilience of our democracies. And a uh, crucial part where it comes to play is actually science for policy. So I'm uh, very happy to be here to discuss it today with you. My colleague will, uh, will also join the presentation and I give the floor to my fellow co-organizers. My name is Christoph Humburg. I'm the scientific head of the Baltic Sea Center and I would like uh, to welcome you here in the room, but also those of you who are with us on Zoom on behalf of Stockholm University to this session on science for policy. As I understood yesterday, you had important discussions and sessions about open science issues, which I think perfectly sets the scene for today's session on bridging the gap between uh, science and policy, which is also one of the main focus of our center here, the Baltic Sea Center, and you will hear about more about this during the session. I'm really looking forward to this uh, nice session. Thank you. Hello, there we go, okay. So my name is Sverk Lundin, I'm the CEO of the Young Academy of Sweden, and we're also one of the organizers today. Um, the Young Academy of Sweden is a uh, interdisciplinary academy for a selection of the most prominent younger researchers in Sweden. So, um, in essence, we're a, a platform for younger researchers to have a stronger voice in the policy deb debate. And we also work a lot with public engagement and internationalization. One of our most appreciated activities in the academy is a network program that we have together with parliament. So we organize this together with the societies for MPs and researchers, or RIFO in Swedish. And that gives younger researchers an opportunity to meet MPs and exchange on their respective roles. Um, we also are a founding member of YASAS, the Young Academy Science Advice Structure in the EU, that link up to the other academy network in Europe that can then provide science advice for policymaking in Europe. So this topic today is really important to us and I'm delighted to see all of you here and uh, to be able to discuss this today. Now I will leave over to Gunn, who will, Gunn Rudqvist, who will moderate the session. Welcome Gunn. Thank you and thanks to all of you, the organizers. So a warm welcome to all of you who are here in the room and also all of you watching online. My name is Gunn Rudqvist. I work also at Stockholm University Baltic Sea Centre as head of policy. So as Christoph was saying, science for policy is at the core of what the Baltic Sea Centre is, is doing every day, really. So I'll be trying to guide us through this session from 9 to 11. There'll be a break, but no coffee. So um, Please, I hope you've had coffee and you who are online can have your coffee, of course. Yesterday, we got so many good and interesting discussions and presentations that actually lay the foundation for this session. We heard about open science from the perspective mostly of the researchers. And this session will take us a step further towards practice, really. And we will talk more about how you bridge the gap between science and the rest of society. You know, the number of stakeholders out there who need all your results. There will be four presentations from uh, people with different uh, angles of this topic. And then we will finalize with a panel with three people. And they also come from different perspectives. And we will be talking about this. 
So please, you know, think about questions and comments and send them over Menti and we will try to address them during the last session, you know, the part that is a panel discussion. But the schedule is full and it's a bit of a hectic schedule, so let's step right on to it. So our first speaker is Mikael Karlsson. Here you are, Mikael. Welcome up here and join me. Mikael, you are an associate professor in environmental science and you also lead the climate Le leadership research group at Uppsala University. But you have a long background in policy and science issues. I mean, both from your research perspective, but also as previous chair of one of the largest NGOs in Sweden, working a lot with policy issues. So please, Mikael, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me. I think this is uh, important and also a timely conference. Science describes the world, politics govern the world, from uh, decisions on who should have the cereals first in the morning uh, over breakfast, the youngest kid or the one starting school first, to international treaties on climate change and how to counteract and combat that. Science is concerned with facts, policies, politics is concerned with norms. It's sometimes said that science then should speak truth to power. The question is, to what extent is that possible at all? Which is, I would say, a challenging question since Nothing here could be achieved in this conference today without science. Science is fundamentally indispensable in the modern world. Everything we know from agriculture to medicine to technologies, communication, transportation, is dependent on scientific findings. At the same time, politics is indispensable if you want to act on what science shows is happening with the climate system, with the ozone layer, with biodiversity. And it's clear from scientific studies that liberal democratic governance systems are superior to all other systems in coping with these challenges and finding solutions based on the warnings coming from science. But science is based on evidence. Politics deal with values. Science function according to review and revise. In politics, you debate and vote. In science, Earth can be either flat or spheric. In politics, you can negotiate and say that the world is an oval. So they are very different characters in these systems. Science is open, politics is closed. Science is, is, is conducted by experts, policies, politics, by laymen, by ordinary people. Scientists can be politicians, but it's very difficult for politicians to be scientists without much training. Science is very precise. Politics is characterized by rhetoric. Science functions according to principles. Politics is opportunistic. Science often takes a lot of time, whereas politics is functioning in rapid systems on a daily basis or terms of office. So there are differences in terms of contexts, cultures, objectives, motives, audiences, language, financing, and a lot of other things that we see makes it difficult. Still, if we have science as one sphere and policy and politics as another, they are not separated. We see politicians interfering in science. For instance, someone might have the idea to kick out all those in the boards of universities. And we see scientists speaking about politics, for instance, to abandon parts of the law on ethical um, applications. But when science now delivers all these truths about what's happening with the climate system, with toxic substances, with loss of biodiversity, 
Do politics act on that? The tragic answer is no, not according to the target set by the politicians themselves. 15 out of 16 environmental quality objectives in Sweden are not reached. We're the same on EU, we have the same in numerous countries, we're the same uh, on the global situation. So what can be done then? Well, <clears throat> I would base this on having worked in some 20 governmental inquiries in Sweden as an expert in different capacities, five, six high-level groups on uh, EU policies at the EU Commission and in a lot of other fora. And I would say that in science, first out of ten points is to, to counteract science denial, to speak out what does science say, and take a stance against those denying science, whether it's about the Holocaust, climate change, or relativity theory, or something else. That is something that all scientists have to do. A second point in order to do that is to promote scientific consensus as often as, as possible, in particular when we have the, the long-term wicked problems on the agenda. Those where you see the costs now, but the benefits in terms of l smaller problems in the future, some, some, some other time, somewhere else. Then it's very important to build consensus, to generate a strong pool of facts. Where would we have been in climate governance without IPCC, for example? And why are we lacking that type of scientific consensus building bodies in other areas of critical problems? A third thing is, of course, to, that scientists need to reflect over their role. And this can be characterized in different ways. One categorization is that we have the, the, pure, the pure scientist uh, as one of four, focusing on the scientific um, research questions, not interacting with society. We have the science arbiter, we have the issue advocate, and we have the honest broker, who to various extent, interact with society. And as a fourth point, I think therefore it's important to be transparent on your norms. When I do climate governance research, I'm clear that, well, I want to find ideas, solutions, policy, governance systems that promote the fulfillment of the Paris Agreement or the Swedish Parliament's climate targets. So that's where I'm standing, which makes it possible not only for me to evaluate policies, but also for others to evaluate what I'm doing. In these interactions, we also need to be, as scientists, policy relevant. And um, that, of course, requires that you know something. Scientists that work as experts and give expert-based advice, or science-informed advice, whatever you call it, need to learn how does the policy cycle function. The question of what, why, who, when that are relevant in policy making are crucial for scientists to think about. What's the timing? How can I be relevant? And what's the delivery method? Writing a scientific paper, nothing more. Writing a popular report, writing an op-ed for each scientific paper, communicate face-to-face, -face, attend meetings, participate in processes, in committees, etc. And also to promote and actually present alternatives for policymakers, uh, and explaining the pros and cons with those. A sixth point is transdisciplinarity, and transdisciplinarity for me is more than scientists working together uh, and being very open on methods and theories, but also to involving stakeholders, at least if you do societal relevant research, um, for instance about landscape governance or whatever it might be, to include them. Seventh point would be, in the extension of that, to think about inclusiveness, openness in relation to society, which is a theme, of course, for, for these days as well. Participatory science, citizen science, to think about that. Sometimes it's crucial, sometimes it's not needed. When is it needed? Not. Point eight, be self-critical and be open question your own results and communicate also uncertainties in findings. That is very important because someone else will do it anyway and then you will lose some trust and credibility, of 
of course, it's about honesty. Ninth point, build trust. We see uh, quite high trust in, in, in science, and we also see in Eurobarometers, I think it was 68, 70%, something like that, wanted scientists to be active on societal issues, but trust building is crucial. And the last point is defend the integrity of science. Speak out when you see too much political interference, when politicians, well, move into details in university governance or criticize researchers or as when I was in yesterday, yesterday in Gothenburg at the university, we had an open seminar in the evening. There were five politicians sitting with film cameras filming the audiences when they asked questions, wanted to put it on the net. Such things happen increasingly. In politics, well, it's just as important for politicians as for scientists to counteract science denial. And to, of course, avoid denying science yourself. We see that happening all around the world and in the Swedish parliament. It's important to defend science. Politicians should have at least one arm length to science, not interfere in details. Keep your fingers off universities, trust them. And be clear on facts and norms. Don't confuse them. Of course, you can vote whether or not the Earth is flat or spheric and end up with the Earth being an oval and criticize favorable conservation status or climate sensitivity, but we seldom see politicians voting on how many people can this elevator lift. Scientists say 10 and politicians vote for 12. That's not happening. But in other fields, this is a fact today, including in environmental governance, and that's so strange. It's important as a fourth point to generate arenas for meetings. And fifth, when seeking science-based advice, don't take scientists as hostages. Don't use them as for getting, a, in my field, a green alibi. Give sufficient time for learning. And I think the Swedish All Party Committee on Environmental Objectives is a very good example where politicians who debated fiercely in the parliament, in society at large, actually sat together, the seven democratic parties, in a room for one and a half, two years and came out with the most ambitious climate policy framework in the world. After having listened to expertise and of course weighted alternatives based on the various norms that they defended. Abandon appraisal dogmas. We often see that a call for, well, neoclassic economic tools when we know from science that they're clearly insufficient to understand and grasp and deal with wicked problems um, in governance systems. Avoid silos, pro promote co coherence, etc. Six point in governance. Build organizations, build boundary organizations, research councils, climate policy councils, um, other types of, of bodies that can deliver scientific advisors, etc., that can deliver science based advice. There are numerous examples around the world. Seventh, it is of course crucial to also use the scientific findings in not only appraisals but in decision-making, in the end. Often, a lot of information is gathered, but that's where it stops, and then policy-making continues as if that evidence is not there. Eight, defend public service media. It's crucial for communication. Ninth, finance science communication. I think we have a, at least two orders of magnitude more financing in doing research than communicating research, and of course that steers uh, scientists' priorities. Last point is, as for scientists, to build trust and to avoid populism and polarization, which are actually, again, becoming more common today. That's not how we build a better world. Is it finally then just a lot of gaps, a gloomy situation, are politicians not listening to science? Often not, but in many cases they are. And when I meet younger people and students and others who have anxiety and see that if there's no future due to climate change and biodiversity loss, etc., we can clearly see that what has happened in the last decades is that politicians have actually acted based on the best available science 
to a much larger extent than ever before in history. You see European Union, US, other areas in the world moving on these crucial issues. We had the Paris Agreement in 2015, where we had politics for the first time considering scientific findings. And after that, the expected temperature increase by the end of this century is probably more than one 1.5 degrees lower than before. And then we're talking about two very different planets. So there is hope in havoc indeed. And science clearly shows that there is nothing in when it comes to economics, technical systems, natural resources that would prevent us to cope with all these global challenges. That is indeed possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Rikel. I mean, as always, very sort of to, to the point. Uh, I loved your 10 things to go through, but you touched upon risks, of course, you know, that dual position and dual possibilities for a scientist. And I mean, you already talked about the fact that you are sometimes regarded as an activist and how, how are they? But are there other major risks, maybe from the more academia perspective? I think academic systems, in, in the field of em environment studies, uh, it's not a problem today to, to be, I wouldn't consider, I, I think the word activist is a bit problematic. Uh, and of, of course, all politicians love activists if they are active in support of what you're thinking. It's the same with all stakeholders. I'm the best scientist in the world, according to the Swedish forest industries, when I talk about bioenergy, but I say what science says about biodiversity, I'm the lousiest scientist in the world. And it's the same with political parties. So I think, I mean, I don't see it as a problem, but I think there should be, in science in general, first I think we should have more uh, financing of communication. Uh, we should have stricter demands uh, in research applications so to communicate science and and there should be also let's say reward and career systems in science where it's not only the number of papers you have produced in in high-ranking journals that counts and i think we see a, a trend towards something else but also counteracting trends unless you publish in nature you're not worth it and i think that that really needs to be reconsidered in in um, by research councils and by the university. So you would love to see the funding sort of both coming maybe from the universities, so pushing and encouraging outreach work even more? Are they doing enough, the universities? N not at all. But I also think, I mean, a, a lot of science is, is about digging deeper and deeper in the hole without communication. Well, they need to do some, that as some well. Some are skilled yeah. to do that and they should do that. But if we talk about funding of research that is supposed to deliver scientific findings to, to uh, achieve the sustainable development goals, etc. I don't think you should give, science, give funding to projects that have no idea uh, about communication or that throw in stakeholders after they have received their funding. That's not relevant for the questions that, that are asked in society. I think, I think that's a very problematic. But I see that that's increasingly happening. Uh, at the same time, we have this international trend with high ranking journals. That's what counts. So, um, much more needs to be done okay. so, in uh, Europe. So, final question before we have to sort of round up. Um, would you say that these trends are European-wide, international-wide, or are there changes? You know, is it Europe is standing out as something different, or what do you see in your international outlook? Um, I think it's important as a scientist to say that you don't know sometimes, and I don't. Okay, that's a good thing. Final perfect way. Thanks a lot, Mikael. <laughs> Here's a small gift for you to bring home. <laughs> All right, we will move on directly to the next fantastic speaker. And I welcome Julian Keimer up on the stage. You are from the European Commission Joint Research Center. Very welcome, a warm welcome. I hope you had a good traveling here to Stockholm. You will talk a bit about sort of what does the European Commission work with and you have yourself a research background and you're also a knowledge manager and you've worked a lot with issues on values and identities in your present work as well. Please yeah. Julian, you're welcome. That's correct. Uh, yeah, indeed. So I wait for my slides to come. Uh, do I have to? Yes. I have to do it myself. Right. Got it. 
<laughs> Makes sense. Um, yeah, welcome. Thank you for uh, being allowed to speak here. So I will give you the perspective um, of yeah, an international perspective or an EU perspective on evidence-informed policymaking and science for policy. Um, uh, as Gun just said, I'm from the Joint Research Center, like my colleague Agnieszka, who spoke uh, in the opening of this session. And maybe I should give you a short um, introduction of what the Joint Research Center actually is and does, because it's part of the European Commission, but it's actually a research center. So the main focus is to advise policy with, uh, with excellent science. So there are more than 2,000 researchers working there um, who, um, who yeah, advise the policy makers who then draft laws or in, yeah, come up with funding programs or other programs to change how Europeans well, live their lives ultimately um, with scientific evidence. And if we're going to the next slide now, well, you could ask, why do we even need better science, or why do we want better science, better evidence for policy? Uh, and there are fundamentally four reasons. Uh, one, we are dealing with complex problems. And you don't easily solve complex problems with just a rule-by-thumb approach. You actually need some good evidence, good science to solve them. Then, citizens also want it. Uh, there are various surveys where citizens express that they want scientists to get involved in policy making and they want policy makers and politicians to be, they want scientists, uh, scientists to call out policy makers and politicians if they use incorrect science or fake science. So there's actually demand for this kind of service. And um, thirdly, it helps counter mis and disinformation. So obviously, there's a lot of mis and disinformation out there. There are people who just have incorrect perceptions about scientific knowledge, but there are also people who um, actually want to spread factually incorrect knowledge, knowingly want to spread that knowledge, um, and bringing good scientific knowledge into policy making helps counter that. Um, because it also reinforces the, the policy makers in their uh, belief that, well, there is some kind of actually correct information that they can trust. Um, or, well, I'm going to sort of go a bit into relativizing the term correct that I used here now later on, but um, let's keep it for now. And it enriches public debates. It actually makes public debates more interesting, more, more complete if we don't just talk on a surface level, but talk about actually good evidence. And um, we approached this problem in our team um, by looking at the science for policy ecosystems in various EU member states. So, oh yeah, I, I know, yeah, sorry. Um, like, I'm, I'm, I'm having the slides here looking for me, <laughs> but I also have to change them for you, obviously. <laughs> um, so, science for policy ecosystems. There are ultimately three aspects of these ecosystems. There is the use of experts in public administration. So, how um, public administration demands information from experts, but also how experts have access to public administration, the internal capacity of public administration, and you could argue, in, in some sense, the JRC uh, is somehow some kind of public uh, uh, internal capacity of a public administration, um, but you also often, uh, just in ministries, for example, in uh, ministries of economy, you often have analysts who can run their own scientific analyses, and in other ministries you have other um, kinds of experts who can run their own analyses, so there may be already quite strong capacity inside the public administration. And then the processes for exchange, calls for evidence, or areas um, of research interest where there is actual direct exchange, 
fora where policymakers and scientists can come together and exchange information, exchange views, and also build trust, because we learned that um, building trust is actually extremely important through a series of national workshops that we did where we discussed with experts in the national ecosystems what, um, what is most important, what is working well, what is difficult, what are the problems that they are struggling with, both from the side of the policymakers, but also from the side of the scientists. Um, and what would each of them need to get better. And that way we understood that there are actually three aspects that are a bit different than the three I mentioned before to good science for policy. There's the institutional environment, but there's also the individual capacity of policymakers and scientists, um, and also the group capacity of teams. And then there is something like fair use or good governance of evidence. Um, and if you don't fully, if it's not fully clear to you what that last aspect is right now, I will explain it a bit later because that goes back to what Gunn introduced me with values and identities. So, if we're looking at the institutional support, we are trying to help as the Joint Research Center, as the evidence informed policy making team in the Joint Research Center, we're trying to help member states, regions um, to get better at it but also, obviously, the European Commission itself and the European institutions. There is the better regulation framework. Um, there is um, also a new vision for public administration fit for the future. And all of that, we hope, can lead to a new era of, um, um, of, of public administration, of evidence-informed policymaking, a policy framework co-creation with member states for research and innovation. Um, so these are sort of their various um, options for institutional support. And I will actually come to a specific example of institutional support a little bit later uh, once I've um, summed up the, the general approach. Then there is the individual capacity, individual and team capacity. And to tackle that problem, we have created competence frameworks for policymakers and for researchers. Competence frameworks to tell them, but also tell their organizations which competences they need to work together better. Um, and for scientists, it's the one on the bottom. There are five clusters of competences. In each of these clusters, there are three to six competences. And um, each competence, you can have different levels. And now if you think about it, you can't be an expert in everything, but there should probably be someone in the organization that you're working in who is an expert in everything. I mean, not one person, but somebody should be, you should have one person to be an expert in the one thing and another one to be an expert in the other thing, and so on. So that on a, on a team level or on an organization level, everything is covered. And based on that, we have developed trainings for policymakers, uh, for, for researchers, and we are developing a training for policymakers um, to work better together. For the researchers, we also have already trained trainers um, that in various member states so that they can actually go out to other organizations, institutions that request this training and give it there. So if you're interested in such a training, come to me. There are actually people in this room who have taken the training of trainers and who would hopefully be happy to help you. But Lastly, to coming to the last point, we also don't want things to be an expertocracy. So, I talked about fair use of evidence and um, good governance of evidence use. Evidence can take us so far if we know what our goals are but it doesn't tell us what we should actually aim for as a society. That's a political question, and that is a political question that is informed by values. 
and a political discussion and debate about these values. Um, and that's why we also did research into values and identities and um, uh, meaningful and ethical communication will be the next output from this research program. Um, and there, we are basically trying to understand what are the delineations between what evidence can do for you as a public administration or as a policymaker and what you have to get from people's values, political decision making, political sort of guidance. Um, yeah, we hope in that way, <coughs> By, by sort of splitting up the debate and saying, well, look, that's, the, that's a values question. We can't answer it with evidence. We hope to actually agree more on the evidence and then accept that we may have different values because it's okay to have different values to a certain degree. And now I'm coming to a practical... Ah, okay, this is, I'm just going to give you the whole slide already. Um, coming to a practical example of how all of this can practically be implemented or how we can practically try to implement this. So first of all, we started off with a um, commission staff working document. Um, and this hopefully in the future will lead to council conclusions, um, also on evidence-informed policy making or science for policy. Um, in this staff working document, there are various um, various mechanisms, various support mechanisms offered to member states, and um, one of them, or is the technical support instrument of DG reform, and there under this instrument, my unit is currently working with seven member states. Uh, Sweden, sadly, is not among them because they, they have to apply. Um, you have to apply yet, indeed. Yeah, um, You have to apply as a member state to be part of uh, any technical support instrument project. And these seven member states applied for better science for policy. Um, and there we are actually working together with them in first assessing in depth the current state of their science for policy ecosystem. Um, but also then improving them with, for example, the trainings that I just mentioned, um, giving them to policymakers, to trainers there who can then train more people in their organizations. Um, so that's a practical use. And if you feel that maybe in your member state you want to convince someone to apply, uh, please go ahead. Uh, we would be very happy about that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Julian, and so nice to hear both you and Mikael sort of stressing values and trust and building dialogue. And as I see you mean the Joint Research Centre, they are doing tons of things. Could you also maybe talk a little bit about that forum for exchange that's available on the net, where researchers can sort of become a part of that? Because that would be a good sort of suggestion for people to step in, right? Yeah, actually, uh, a very good suggestion. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we do have a, an online uh, forum called Knowledge for Policy, um, where all of you can register and um, exchange or post blog posts and so on. Um, and, and yeah, by that be sort of more directly connected with researchers from the Joint Research Center, but also potentially uh, get more publicity for um, scientific knowledge that you can offer to policymaking. Thank you. I often hear from researchers that it's so difficult for them to sort of grasp the value and possibilities of the policymaker. How, how do you bridge that from the Joint Research Center? What, what do you do to get sort yeah. of that understanding increasing? Yeah, I think the, the two main things you can do is one, just create meeting opportunities and optimally not when, when there's already pressure there. So uh, when, not only when the policymaker needs information on something and uh, hopefully last week. 
but um, <laughs> but rather like just kind of meeting opportunities. So you're talking really um, about a continuous sort of exchange and dialogue. It's very helpful, yeah. Because time limits for policymakers is really, as you say, short. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. They want their answer then, today. Of course, if you already understand each other a little bit yeah. and have a working relationship, maybe, then it's easier to also maybe overcome these time limits or understand that you can call someone on a short notice and they they still try to help you, let's say, as exactly. a researcher. Yeah, but only people yeah. only a phone call away, right? Sort of. Exactly. Well, that's that's the nice thing about the Joint Research Centre. It's inside the same organisation. That's a good um, For the policymakers on the European level, at least. And the other thing is these trainings that I mentioned. Um, we So by now we have trained uh, more than half of all the researchers in the European Commission Joint Research Centre have taken this training for researchers. And they're... Part of that training is also a role-playing game where you have to engage with a sort of imagined policymaker and you have to put yourself into the position of a policymaker. And that helps from the side of the scientists to um, get to understand better what policymakers need. And now we're developing a similar training for policymakers to help them understand better how they can ask the right questions to scientists and, and how they can also work in a way that makes it possible for scientists to give them good answers. Yeah. That sounds wonderful. I think we should really ask you to come here to Sweden and do the same thing here. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank so you. far, one warm welcome. Thank you. Julian, we have a small gift here, so coming this way, yes. <laughs> um, thanks a lot. And this, I think, really created a good background for the next speaker, Ellen Bruno, who's a colleague of me of mine for the Stockholm University Baltic Sea Centre. You have a background as a marine biologist, but you've also been working all your life sort of in different policy situations. You, you've been to the European Commission working with marine issues there. You've been at the uh, MSC and you work with the NGO sector, etc. And you will give us a presentation of a more practical approach as sort of trying to give an example of how we can do this. Please, Ellen. Thank you, Gun. Good. Sorry. Um, Hi everyone and hello to you online. Um, so excited to be here today and to be able to share the working method that we have developed, I guess, mainly good, uh, at the Baltic Sea Center. Um, as you mentioned, I am a marine biologist, but I have been working on this policy, trying to change policy actually for many, many years. And, um, it's a, it's a skill I think quite many lobbyists know about, but maybe not so much in academia. And I will go through what we are a little bit shortly um, and why scientists should communicate, of course, and work together with policy. And also this knowledge broker that we call ourselves right now, or policy analyst. Could we be a bridge or a key for helping out? And also some lessons learned from what we've been doing the last years. Uh, so the Baltic Sea Center belongs to Stockholm University. We have been around for 10 years. We actually just celebrated with bubbles. And we've been working on this policy interactions for, well, the last six years at least. Um, we have researchers, we have communicators, and we have policy analysts. And we try to support our researchers. We have around 300 at Stockholm University, but we also have, of course, researchers all around the Baltic Sea. And our mission is to improve the status or improve the health of the Baltic Sea environment. So we have a very clear mission and we have a very broad mandate of how to work with that. We uh, attack it or we focus on the four main stresses on the Baltic Sea, eutrophication, the hazardous substances, fisheries and climate change. And of course, the million dollar question is why? Um, and the answer, I guess, is quite simple as well. It's um, 
because it's actually required, it's uh, legal, legally required. Um, we have a Swedish Higher Education Act, I don't know if the same in all our countries, but where we have three main missions, it's to educate, it's to do research, and it's also to interact with the society. So this is the third task and it's something we talk quite a lot about and apparently something that we need to be better on. But besides that, so it's legally required, why would researchers want to do this? And we've asked them and they have, of course, different answers, all of them. Uh, some really feel like it's important that their work contribute to the scientific development. Um, some also feel like their own work gets better if they get this from the outside. And uh, the answers, I guess, are as many as scientists, but not all scientists are that interested either. Um, and for different reasons. I mean, some are really into studying their microcosmos and they love that. Um, still not, it, it doesn't always work. And uh, I'm, I took this from uh, one of the reports made by Vieteskapen Almenhet, one of the um, co-organizers here today. And they asked actually thousands of researchers who they would like to communicate with and who they want to use their knowledge. And they, on top of their list, was that they wanted to communicate with politicians and policymakers, and also actually with the general public. But the main person that they did communicate were professionals. So with doctors or engineers or people working within their area of expertise. Maybe not that weird. And the reason that they stated was that they have other higher priorities and they lack resources to communicate. And, and I guess this is where we come in. They have difficulties in finding the right opportunities and audiences to communicate with policymakers. So how can we overcome this? Well, at the Baltic Sea Center, we believe that knowledge brokers can be one way of doing it. Uh, a knowledge broker would have good scientific knowledge of the area they work within. Um, but also, and I guess this is what divides them from the research, they have a really good knowledge of how policy processes move. And ideally, both in nationally, EU, globally. Um, if you come of age, like a few of us do, uh, you also probably have developed a pretty good network uh, with policymakers, with researchers and also stakeholders. So NGOs and other organizations that you, that actually drives the agenda. And again, good if you have good communication skills, because this in the end actually also is about communication. And ideally, they should um, know what's brewing. They should have the air to ground and they should know quite early on what's moving. And I just took one of these examples. So we made a policy brief on advanced wastewater treatment already in 2017, when we saw that this is coming up. This is in the European Commission working plan to update the wastewater treatment directive. Um, and so already then we started working on getting the data we have from researchers to be able to put that into the process. Uh, right. Um, and of course, recognize the science needs and um, identify the appropriate channels, pathways to come up with the knowledge that we, our researchers have. Um, Facilitate the knowledge flow. That could be setting up meetings with between scientists and policymakers. It could be seminars. I'll show a little bit more what we do. And of course, engage in discussions. There are lots of discussions going on, like conference like this, or um, of course, social media. 
Twitter, LinkedIn. There are of course also other ways of doing this. Our way is one way. Um, you can educate um, researchers about policy work, actually also communicators. Um, you can give them, I think as Michael said, you have to give them time and merit to do this kind of work because it takes actually a lot of time to follow processes, to read newspapers or newsletters and um, have lunch with policymakers, all these things that is done from behind. And I'm not sure all researchers want to do it. Uh, so, when do we actually engage in policy? Well, we have two quite clear uh, timings when we do things. The first is when we see that there is a policy process going on and we know that there is scientific knowledge that needs to be in there, in the process, for it to go the right way. And the second timing is when we have important scientific knowledge that we believe should lead some kind of policy process or political decision. So I would say that's the when. And what we communicate is always decided by the scientist. We, um, it often stems from a scientific paper um, and we always have the name of the scientist backing up the message. So it's not what I want, it's what our scientists say that they want or what they believe is the best policy option to reach a good environmental status, in this case, in the Baltic Sea. And so how do we do it? Well, we do quite a few of these policy briefs. Um, we answer to consultations, we do fact sheets, we arrange short seminars once a month. They call the Baltic Breakfast and we do it centrally and we get people from all around the society to engage with and to actually listen to two uh, researchers telling them the latest news within this specific area. And it's always something that is high on the agenda, like in building windmills at sea or something. Um, we also believe in uh, the personal eye to eye, the relationship building. So we try to make sure that researchers actually meet policy, uh, policy makers. And this is the example where our researcher Henrik Swedeng, who is doing research on herring, is at the European Parliament and talking to the politicians about his findings. And we do trips like that together with our communicators, our researchers and our stake um, knowledge brokers. Mm -hmm. So, is it successful? Well, I don't know if I can say it is or not, but it has been evaluated a couple of times in science. Uh, you can read them and uh, I think there are some things that are constantly um, taken up from these papers that the personal relationships are important, trust is important, like Michael said. So you actually need to be out there and you need to talk to people. And I think the lessons we have learned um, and again asking people that we work with is that the researcher appreciate this. Like you remember that they, they lack the opportunities to talk to policymakers. Well, we give them that kind of platform. Um, on the other hand, they also quite often feel that they can't prioritize the work. At, at our Baltic Sea Center, our researchers have time to do that, which is great, but of course, that is not how it looks in the rest of the world. So, but we feel like it's really important to go hand in hand, communicators and researchers and policy analysts to get the message through in an efficient way. Um, also very appreciated by stakeholders because they feel that they get the right information at the right time in the right format. Of course, to do, able to do that, you need to have, be really agile and flexible and be able to quickly answer an email from a parliamentarian who's going up for a debate in two hours. So they say, what do you know about climate change and the water? And we can give them a short 
sentence or a couple of sentences about it. Um, yeah, and as everyone who works with policy processes, it's a very long process. If you want to change something, you need to be persistent. And um, yeah, we have been doing it now for 10 years. Um, I hope that we have changed or will be uh, hope, uh, helping to change some policy decisions. Um, but it's not like a one shot. You have to really think a long time when you do this. Can I finish with one last question, actually? Because um, we don't really, we feel quite alone, to be honest. Um, we're constantly looking for other knowledge brokers at other universities around the world or around the Baltic would be great uh, to learn from them and to exchange experiences. So if you have someone you know about, <laughs> please send them to us and <laughs> we can maybe work together even more. I think that's it. Thank you, Ellen. <laughs>but again, I also believe that our personal relationship building and the way for politicians to call us and say, can I talk to your best beautification researchers about, I have 10 questions. I think that's also something that is valuable, appreciated. Uh, and it's, of course, agencies work for the government. Huh? We work um, not only for the government, we also work for the opposition or stakeholders or other ones who wants to drive a political agenda. So we help them all. We serve all. Yes, that's a good thing. Yes. Um, do you also see risks with these kind of policy interactions? I mean, we've talked a bit about risks earlier, but what would you say about the risks? I think there's always a risk that you, you become biased with the people, the research you know, and the things you hear about, etc. So I think, uh, you know, if you're a governmental agency, you have the possibility to actually really get a lot of research working with you, etc. cetera. Um, whereas we, of course, work with mainly Stockholm University because we're paid from them, but also from the ones that we know about, our network, etc. cetera. Uh, so I think we need to be really careful uh, also when we do our policy brief, making sure that uh, if there are different views, because sometimes scientists say different things, they don't agree, that we also mirror that when we so, communicate. Yeah, so what you're actually saying is to keep what Mikkel was, and Julian was talking about, values and facts apart. Yeah. What is the norm and what are, is actually the scientific findings? Is that what you're getting at? So, yeah, yeah, I guess so. Mm -hmm. okay, because researchers come with that scientific findings, of course. Mm. Um, you said that Stockholm University is paying us in that case, you know, so that's unique then, that Stockholm University has done this, right? I think so. Um, and I think it's a very... Last question. Is there yeah. anybody out there sort of maybe one? It's a, I think it's a very brave uh, move, actually. And um, of course, for some of our research projects, they also pay us to do policy work. So it's not only Stockholm University. Um, but I think um, I think it's something that should be part of the future, actually, because there's just so much information out there. And, you know, just putting out a press release, not sure it's going to reach the right policymakers, to be honest. I think you really need to be more targeted today. Well, thank you. We'll get back to these issues during panel discussion later. Thanks a lot, Ellen. Thank you. So you've been sitting now for a whole hour. So now you have like 10 minutes to talk to your neighbor. 
I'm sorry, there's no coffee. There's coffee at 11, so please don't leave the room, but, you know, stand up, stretch your legs. There'll be a 10-minute, you know, intervention of just talking to your neighbor. And maybe discuss with your neighbor and end up with a mentee question that you can send to the panel. What has been lacking? What you, what you want to know more about? So, 10 minutes, we'll be back at 10.15. Georgiana. <laughs>
your minutes to settle in your seats and you know i hope you feel a bit refreshed at least and i've just realized i made a mistake i promised coffee but there's no coffee but there is at least refreshments out there at 11 so you can look forward to that i'm sorry about that all right let's keep going um now we have our fourth speaker a wonderful person representing young academy of sweden jessica jewel please you're welcome here nice to have you here you are an associate professor in energy transitions at the department of space earth and environment at chalmers university in Göteborg, gothenburg <clears throat> But you're also a professor at the Center for Climate and uh, Energy Transformation at the University of Bergen in Norway. Wonderful. Uh, you've been involved in a number of these science policy processes, for instance, the IPCC uh, underground, under groups. Uh, so uh, please, uh, it would be very interesting to hear your views on this science policy topic. Thank you so much. So today I'm going to talk about the science policy interface from my interaction and from my field. And I'm here both as a researcher and also as a member of the Swedish Young Academy. And I want to talk about the science policy interface and the opportunities and also the risks that come from it. And my starting point is that as scientists, we're very privileged. We're privileged to pursue our passions. We're privileged to pursue our curiosity. But with that privilege comes serious responsibility. And I think this resp these responsibilities were codified really nicely in this si paper in science from about 25 years ago. And these responsibilities for scientists are fourfold. One is focus on the most important issues. Two is do excellent science. Three is communicate our findings widely. And four is exercise good judgment, um, wisdom, and humility. And these are very nice words. And when you first read them, it sounds like, oh, great, let's just do this. But when you actually put it into practice, we run into some trade-offs and from some difficulties. And that's what I want to unpack today. And I want to unpack it with looking at the history of how climate science has interacted with policy. And climate science has interacted with policy in really three phases. And the first phase was when science alerts policymakers about the risk. So this is James Hansen. He was the director of the NASA Goddard Center in the US. And so the scientific community had realized that climate was changing, that there was global warming. And, so, and Jim Hansen came to the US Congress on a really hot August day in 1988. And he said, we have a problem. This is going to pose risks to our society. And the message that came back from scientists is, okay, well, what's the solution? Tell us what to do. You found a problem, now tell us what to do. And this dialogue started to move science into the second phase of climate science and policy. And in the second phase, science spent all years almost decades <laughs> identifying pathways to reduce climate risks. And the scientific finding was there are many solutions to a climate safe future. So this picture is from uh, the IR5 report, which was published in 2014. And in each of these cones is dozens, some, some, some of these cones have hundreds of pathways, that, and the lower pathways stabilize climate at a climate safe future. Now, this looking at these pathways and unpacking these pathways, policymakers and scientists themselves started to go into them, and then they started to be concerned. They said, well, can we really do this? A lot of these pathways that keep warming at two degrees actually have a ton of um, negative emissions. And so another question came from science, from policy, which reshaped how science, what we're focusing on today, which is, but which solutions are feasible? What can we really do? And basically, policymakers said, OK, well, we can solve science. You can solve science in this, these mathematical models, but can we solve it in the real world? Because when scientists present these pathways, they said, OK, these pathways are feasible. But feasible means something very different to the scientist than it does to the politician. So something that's feasible for the policymaker means something that we can actually do. Something that's feasible to these scientists is something that solves in their mathematical models. And this is really where a lot of the climate change debate is today. Whether it's in Sweden, okay, is, 
expanding wind fast enough or expanding nuclear fast enough, or which policy instruments should we use? Will there be higher public acceptance for feed-in tariffs and renewable portfolio standards or carbon taxes? And this is really where the debate is today. Uh, this is also what I work on, which is how, which solutions are most feasible, which are most realistic to do in the real world. And I think with this, it, it, it's no longer just a scientific question. It's also a political question. It involves policy interaction. And there is agency here. And I think we see really two models dealing with this uh, interaction. One is co-production, which we've talked about this morning. And the opportunities with this is that you do useful and relevant science and maybe you influence policy. That's what we're here for, right? But there's also a risk. And the risk is that this co-production becomes an echo chamber. Some scholars have called this um, codependence, not co-production, but actually codependence. And I think this is illustrated really nice. Uh, this is an article published earlier this year, which documents the history of the 1.5 target. And we often think of this target as a target that came from science. But it was actually adopted in Paris in 2015. And then policymakers said, OK, well, now we need the science. And scientists said, well, we really don't have science for this target. And policymakers said, well, can you make it? And scientists were like, oh, well, you know, we're not really sure that our two degree scenarios are actually realistic, you know. Um, well, but then scientists got curious because that's what we do. And also a lot of funding and um, political support came for pursuing this 1.5 target. And there was a ton of science that came out on this 1.5 target. So in some ways, this is really a success story of co-production because something comes from the policy sphere and science reorients itself. It also illustrates the risk of codependence that scientists already thought two degrees may be unrealistic and then we produced a ton of science for 1.5. Now, what's the other model of this interaction? And these are two archetypes, so th th there's, not a, there's always a mix with any uh, science policy uh, interaction. The second model is just throw it over the fence. Okay, we do our excellent science and we tell you what to do, we tell you what our science says. The, up the advantage here is that it stays very independent and true to the science. But there is a risk. It avoids the policy question. And I think this is illustrated really nicely with the same 1.5 report that I just spoke about. So scientists were asked, OK, well, is this feasible? And the 1.5 report says limiting warming to 1.5 is possible within the laws of chemistry and physics. And as a policymaker, you say, well, you know, great. I'm glad we're not breaking laws of chemistry and physics. But you know, there are also other laws and um, mechanisms that we may need to consider. And in the um, press conference, uh, this is from, uh, this was what Jim Skia said about feasibility. He said, we have delivered the message to governments. Now it is up to them to decide the final feasibility step. So you see really these two models of just throw it over the fence or this codependence. And both have opportunities and risks. Now, the way I try to deal with this in my own work is I try to work on important problems in a slightly smaller um, with slightly smaller boundaries. So I was recently asked by Australia's largest utility to, of if, their, if the um, transformation scenario, this is their most ambitious transformation scenario with the most rapid decarbonization, if it's feasible. And rather than giving them a yes or no answer, I started breaking it up into individual components and saying, OK, well, what can we learn from world leaders? And today, I'm just going to show you how we analyzed wind in this. So this is the growth of wind power in this scenario. And what we did was we said, OK, well, let's look at the fastest growing countries and compare it to what needs to happen in Australia. And also what the most ambitious countries plan for wind power. And so rather than returning with a yes or no question, yes, it's feasible or no, it's not, we said, yes, it's feasible if Australia can put as much energy and effort into growing wind as Sweden and Germany have. So I want to conclude by returning to this social contract for science. And with I think we have several obligations as scientists. One is to focus on the most important problems, but make them specific and concrete enough so that they're relatable within policy 
arenas. The second is do excellent science, of course. The third is communicate in a relatable way. So we shouldn't only just communicate our findings widely, but we need to make them relatable to the policy um, problems and policy issues which policymakers are facing. The fourth is we need to do this while exercising humility. As Michael said this morning, we need to be prepared to say when we don't know. This is not a problem for science. This is a problem for society. Now, you may have noticed that there's, this is a one-sided contract that I presented. There are only obligations here for scientists. And in many ways, that's fair, because we are the privileged party in this, con in this contract. But I'm going to step outside of my own humility now and suggest maybe there's also some obligations for society and for policymakers here. And I'm going to suggest two. One is be prepared for inconvenient answers. Often policymakers come to science and say, well, can you show us how to do this? Can you show us how to do that? And we need to be prepared that sometimes this or that may not be feasible. It may not be possible to do in the real world. And we need to be prepared for that. And the second is we shouldn't shift democratic decisions onto scientists. So the environmental challenges that we're facing involve a number of trade-offs. There are winners and losers no matter what path we take. And it is not scientists who should decide who can be the winners, who should be the winners and losers. It is the democratic process that, where this needs to be negotiated. Scientists can inform this process in the role of honest broker, in the role of knowledge broker, and elucidate the trade-offs, and also suggest policies that can help ameliorate the case for the losers. But we cannot make these decisions. So thank you so much, and I'm looking forward to a conversation. <laughs> so, thanks a lot, Jessica, for really sort of structuring the roles of scientists. Uh, would you say that your experience is that the researchers are, you know, more or less willing to step into these different roles? Where are the more comfortable the ones, sort of? Um, in my field, scientists are very. Uh, I mean, we're trained to go out to society and to interact with different stakeholders. I mean, all the, uh, even in our PhDs. I think uh, we don't always have enough reflection about which role we're playing and which model we're operating under. So are we kind of thinking in this linear model of science and just throw it over the fence? Or are we thinking in this stakeholder model and aware of the risks? So I think scientists are very comfortable, but I think we need, um, we need to be more reflective about what role we're playing in different contexts. That links back to your, you said, relatable, which I thought was a nice way of putting it, sort of that putting yourself in somebody else's shoes and understanding these possibilities. Uh, <clears throat> so what's the role then of universities trying to bridge that and see how you can you know, increase the understanding. We've touched upon dialogue so many times today so far. Yeah, I mean, well, so universities are home to many scientists, not all scientists in society. Um, so, I mean, I think universities have a role to train scientists in communication and also bring um, stakeholders and members of the public in to challenge us within our environment. Because you were also sort of, you know, stressing the fact that every solution, a policy solution, is always transdisciplinary. I mean, as we talked about earlier, values and norms. How do you as a researcher sort of um, prepare yourself to handle that with that transdisciplinary approach? Well, I think there are two things to keep in mind here. And one is um, who, who your stakeholders are with any transdisciplinary disciplinary problem and what interests or values they may have. So I take different approaches depending on the scientific problem and the policy problem, right? So if I'm working with vested interests, then I really need to have an arm's length approach so as not to be captured by that agenda. Um, whereas if I'm working with a specific policy case or a specific, you know, so Australia comes to me and says, okay, well, is this feasible? They really need a specific concrete answer and way to understand the challenges that they face. All right. So <clears throat> is there also a role for the funding agencies in sort of supporting these mechanisms? Well, I would like to see a similar increase in reflection in the funding agencies 
to uh, stakeholder engagement and co-production as I think we need to do as scientists. So I think often in funding, in, at least in my field, there's this idea, okay, more stakeholders is always better. And I think we need to be cognizant of, okay, well, what policy problem are we dealing with here? What scientific problem? And based on that, what should be our relationship to different stakeholders? And sometimes it should be arm's length. They should not be involved in our pr project. Um, and sometimes it should be, um, we need to have more space to have specific stakeholder dialogue with, with a smaller group of stakeholders. So maybe a final question then. So what's your experience of working with different stakeholders? Yeah, so I think one of my best experiences actually came when I was working at the International Energy Agency and um, national policymakers had asked the agency to help them understand this new world of energy security. This was in the last energy crisis about a decade ago. And I think it worked really well because there was um, a structured organization and there was a lot of interest from high level um, policymakers. So it wasn't just something that we had come up with, but it was a lot of interest to, they needed help understanding this new world. And I think we were able to do that because there was both interest and then capacity on our side. Thanks a lot. A warm applause for this. <clears throat>So now we come to the final part of this session and uh, I have the privilege of uh, inviting three people up with me and we will have a panel discussion. And now we will also try to uh, answer all, all your questions that's come up, so we'll get back to this. So uh, come and have a seat with me here. First, Amanda Wood, you are a researcher at Stockholm University, Stockholm Research Cent Resilience Center. Yes. So many Stockholm there, yes. Uh, you've done a lot of, in your research on food security issues, you've done a lot of work with stakeholders. So I think we're gonna get back to stakeholders now talking. Yes. Marie-Louise Henel Sandström, please uh, welcome up here on the, on, the, um, on the podium. You are a member of the Swedish parliament. Uh, Yes. And you are also on the board of this very interesting organization where members of parliament meet researchers. And we'll be getting back to that, please. And uh, last but not least, Anders Grönvall. You are today an independent person, which is wonderful <laughs> for you, right? But you have a background which is interesting for this concept because you have, you're a journalist by training, you've worked with the NGO sector, but you also have a long history in the political field, both as um, leading of the opposition at the municipality level, but also within the parliament as state secretary for the Minister for Environment for then at, during those days for the Social Democratic Party. But I'd like to underline that you are now totally independent from a political point of view, which I think is important in this discussion. So I'll try to grab a seat as well here. <clears throat> Well, dear participants, uh, nice to have you here. Welcome. Um, let's start. You've been listening through the morning here. And should we just go around the table first? You know, what is your impressions? Is there something where you've been thinking, oh, wonderful that they talked about this or no, I'm lacking this. Amanda, would you like to go first? You're yeah, thank you. Me. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me today. Um, it's just been a fantastic morning listening to the speakers. And I think a lot resonated in terms of what are these obstacles, what are the realities, what are the risks, but also the opportunities. But I think one thing that was really interesting is trust came up again and again. So when you think about this science policy interface, it's not just evidence and then a policy decision. There is actually a foundation under underneath that, uh, and that is often this trust and relationship building, which hopefully we'll get to expand upon a little bit. But it is. Yes, and I'm very grateful to be here to participate in these uh, very interesting discussions. And I also think about some of the words I've heard lots of times. It was trust, of course, and communication, and uh, politicians, as I am, keep your fingers off. So now I know that. But it's very interesting just to how we communicate. and. I know they said that you have to communicate reliable so that you can this, have communicate in the right way, I think. Uh, yes, <clears throat> I want to lift three things. The first is that uh, the politicians and the, the people and the, the uh, ordinary people is not separated. They are the same thing, actually, and acting as the, as the same thing. So you can't uh, put politicians on a 
uh, outside. You will look at all the people and how they react. So, so you mean that the policy makers are really sort of representing yes. the public? In a democracy, and of course. So, yes. of course. Yeah. And the second thing is that at, uh, they know that uh, we are facing uh, more enormous threats by uh, climate change, loss of biodiversity and pollution. And they're known for maybe 50 years. And the sad thing is, you saw this picture of Jim Hansen talking to the, to the, the American and Congress. And actually, most of the emissions we have today uh, have emitted after this event. And not enough politics has ha happened. Not enough policy has changed that. Do you mean the knowledge is already there? The, the basic knowledge is there of the threat. But the, the important thing is the knowledge of how to solve the problems are not there. So I think politicians have to look at polit politi political science. And political science has uh, investigated this for many years and trying to understand why people are reacting. And Michael uh, Mikkel <laughs> talked about the wicked problems. The wicked problems when, when you have a negative effect in short term in the long-term uh, policies, the long-term policy for climate change. So, so that, that, that's important to, to, to learn more about. And that's my, because I've, I've been, since I left, uh, left the government in October, I've tried to understand this enormous failure. Okay, so you're actually, actually yeah, I mean, yes, we'll, and we'll get I, back to the, the lack yeah. of, of action, really. Yes, yes, yes. So Marilis, would you agree with him that the knowledge is there? Uh, no, <clears throat> I think that some of the knowledge is there, of course, a lot of knowledge is there, but already it changes and we need more knowledge, of course, and we have to new, talk more about the solutions and uh, is it feasible and so we have, I think we, have, we always need more knowledge, but most it is there, of course, and, and all the politicals, politicals we, also, we, we know a lot about it, but we have to discuss how to the financing and how to priority and how we can work with it, I think. So do you experience the same, Amanda, because you've been working a lot with different stakeholders. Is the knowledge there? or? So I think a lot of knowledge is already there. Um, in terms of specific solutions, sometimes not, because sometimes we just need to experiment and actually try something and then research if it works. So I think there is a line between kind of the knowledge to act, which I think is often there, depending on what uh, topic and issue you're looking at and then knowledge about specific interventions that might work and we might have knowledge about similar interventions that have or haven't worked in the past but maybe not that specific one so we have to be a little brave in, in trying trying new things but I think where it gets really tricky is where uh, the argument comes that we just need more knowledge as a way to delay action, mm -hmm. to deliberately delay action. Yeah, yeah just um, asking for another commission to investigate something. Yes. Would you agree? Does this happen? Oh, people are laughing. Yeah, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah some, well, very special topics right now. Of course, I'm working with lots of with education and we have a very big uh, about digitalization in school. We have that for several years, and now we have another discussion to so take away all the dig digitalization and use books more. So that's a very big difference, I think, in, in the school, in education. So then we have to listen. Maybe something wasn't, it was, maybe it was very good, but not it was good enough. Now we have to change. That's a really big change, I think, in school. Anders, would you agree? Well, in, in environment issues, uh, we often looked at efficient uh, uh, tools to make it much efficient, but I think we have to uh, forget that and look more on the the way to navigate through a lot of obstacles to avoid short-term negative effects for for p people and to to have more packages that uh, solve both the negative short-term uh, effects and the long-term positive effects in, uh, like the fit for 55 package in the European Union that's a big good example of how you have to navigate through all the obstacles and that of course is between countries but you can uh, think the same in in different groups in in the country so would you from your different experience would you say that research is, is up and running on these issues I mean because it sounds to me as if you're acting actually asking for a new kind of research or a collaborate, collaborative research or 
Ibland well, no, no, I'm talking about political science. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand that for sure. But you need, probably need science to support yes. that? Yes, or? of course. Yeah. What kind of science would that be then? I think we have a lot of science, so that no, that's not a problem. We need science for de the details, like the waste uh, water management that Ellen talked about. That's a very good example when when the the policymakers need technical uh, issues to make the right decisions. So, so of course, that's mm. uh, a very important job work. But I'm talking more uh, overarching. Okay. <laughs> but but Marilo, is when you are, you know, in your role as a member of the parliament, and how would you then do to get in touch and create this trust and dialogue that we've been talking about so much? Yes, um, we have lots of ways. And as, as a member of the parliament, I think one, one big deal, deal of my job is uh, to be out to countries and, and visit researchers. And, and you started to talk about the, the RIFO. We, talk, we have a, a network in the parliament it, with, with the researchers and politicians. And we follow each other and so follow each other's works and meet them and we talk how we can work together and how we can make better decisions to listen to the researchers, of course. So I think we have, a, maybe we can meet more and learn more, but we can invite and we can also be invited to researchers. As we like to be invited <laughs> and also we like to invite. So we have uh, lots of big seminars in the, in the parliament just to discuss some important things. But would you say that uh, researchers understand what kind of support you need or is that because I've been hinted throughout the morning that there is a understanding gap if one can say that in English I don't know. <laughs> yes yes uh, yeah I heard that and that's very interesting huh? and I've, maybe I think that it's uh, reality that is the gap maybe because uh, we have to think about of course we have to listen to the researchers and also we have to think about um, now in Sweden and Europe and the world of course how we can work with it and how we can do with it just first I told for the the priorities we have to do and the finances we have to do and we also have to see if that's uh, Solutionable? Is it uh, is it the right thing to do? So we have to think for the ethical things about it and how we can do for the democracy, democracy and how we can do it so it be also good for the people. And uh, I will listen to researcher, but is that the right thing? Because I listen to other researcher and have to make a decision. But Okay, yeah, that's, that's again building trust and getting all the different angles of it. But, um, I mean, Amanda, I know that in your research you've been having a lot of dialogue with different stakeholders. How did you go about that? And what's, what is your experience from this? Yeah, so I think first thing first, and I think it's been touched on today, um, how do you build this in the first place? So this is knowing uh, who to connect with. I think this is just sometimes a given that we know who to connect with. And I think it was Ellen talking about finding finding the correct audience. So I think this is one of the first tasks uh, that you need to do. And then again, this relationship building. So these kinds of um, asking for policy advice or uh, leading dialogues, they don't just happen. No one uh, in my experience, they don't just reach out to you in a cold call and ask. So this does take, as, as you were saying, this takes many interactions. This takes inviting decision makers to open seminars that you may be having. It's dedicating time to coffees and understanding what's going on in their organization. It's all of these micro interactions. And I think it was maybe Julian saying that you need to do this before crisis uh, comes. Like this needs to be in a calm period. So uh, spending that time to develop that relationship so you understand their needs, but they also understand your offer in terms of what you are actually researching and what you can produce. I think that is very important. Is time as a researcher to do this? Is it possible? Uh, short answer, no. <laughs> Okay, so what, what would you like to see then to make this happen? So I think one thing, and it's been touched on quite a bit, is actually having these distinct roles. So I think asking a researcher to fit one more thing into their pie of, you know, researching papers, funding, teaching, supervision, all of these things, this just means they will get burnout doing it or they will do none of those things particularly well. So I think having these more specific uh, roles, like I think your organization is a great example. I think um, Mikhail was talking about boundary organizations, um, all different types of, of roles, policy councils, policy analysts, uh, industry postdocs, all different kinds of roles where this is 
more the expectation that is this is your job to do, and then along with that, we've talked about kind of the evaluation and incentives of researchers. If you create these new positions, then you can't judge them on、uh, how many academic publications do you turn out every year and how many. Students, do you supervise? There needs to be a new kind of criteria that matches the responsibilities and the tasks of these roles. I hear that quite a lot. Sort of the the fact that the universities now that are not really giving you credits for doing this kind of outreach. It's it's, it's not a it's part of there, your career possibility. It's there, but it's maybe at the end. Oh, by the way, this is also. Because I think it was your colleague who said this is the third task. It is a legal requirement, but if you look at the actual requirements, it's mostly around what have you published, where have you published, what are your teaching hours in a classroom, in a classroom, and、uh, how many students, and then kind of those last criteria are more around. And can you also prove that you can communicate your science? Okay. So yeah. Now this is interesting. So from your p- different perspectives, would you agree that this is a part of that stakeholder connection, Anders? Yes, of course. And also, don't underestimate to reach out to people in the lower agencies and the lower, because it will come up to. People like <laughs> so. So what you're saying is, go to the civil service and talk to them, or, or, or every, everywhere、uh, it will it will come up in the system、uh, if it's interesting information.、Uh, it will reach the politicians or the the the, the head of the departments.、Mm-hmm. So that's important. Also,、so、maybe it's not so easy to get to ministers and state secretaries and and parliaments.、Uh, Parliamentarians, but you can reach the people in the organization beneath them because it will reach them.、Okay. So you've been working both at municipality level for a long time, but also then at the highest governmental level.、Yep. Was there big differences in your sort of that getting all the research, etc., from the research perspective?、Uh, competence, <laughs> of, course. Level, yeah, of course. Yeah, yes, if you、I、work in the government, you have the best competence. You have the best people、yep. around you, so、okay. they can.、Yep. Uh, But in the smaller areas, you don't. So you have to. So, so, so how would one go about it then? That's say, for instance, the municipality level. How can science then support that level?、Um, shouldn't they? Yes, of course,、uh, they should support, and they they should support.、Uh, they meet people from different、uh, municipalities meet together, and and maybe they can invite、uh, researchers to to help them. So that's、uh, important, and the the. Regional organizations, Landsteels, and is、uh, w- doing、uh, good work、uh, everywhere, but informing the municipalities in in different、um, environment issues. That's the way I know. So, so. Marilla, is from your position in the parliament, is that a different position? I mean, you're supposed to keep an eye on what the government is doing, etc., and push them. So, what is what are your views on this? What Amanda is saying, the stakeholder outreach.、Uh, yes, I'm.、Um, I agree. Some things what you said, of course, but I think that,、uh, and also that Anders told that you have to be on the lower level. And I will come back to the, the education studies I work with. So we we always also used to talk to the to students, of course, not only the leader,、yeah. the students, and also the scientist students. Have, they have their、uh, well, who is it working to be a student and be a science? And they say we have lots of. Problems sometimes get the time and problems to to reach the politics and sometimes maybe they don't want to meet the politics as we heard here and I also agree that, agree that we have to be I have to be pre- prepared to who I will meet as a stakeholder and they have to be prepared to meet me of course so we can reach each other on the right level and、uh, I used to when I will meet some、um, scientists perhaps I also I like to read read about about. So I know about what the scientists have done and what's important for these scientists, and maybe some public publications that they have done before. So we can have a, a discussion on the right level, I think.、Mm-hmm. And I also think that they will do the same for me. They know that I'm working with some questions, and the work I know that I'm working with、uh, with education and higher education, and I, and I know much about it. But、I'm, they need to need more, of course. So I think we have to prepare from both sides.、Mm-hmm. To get the right discussions, and、um, mm-hmm. so is that linked to what Jessica was bringing on the table? You know, like how do you accept an inconvenient、uh, suggestion or <laughs> decision? How do you handle that、uh, when the researchers say you're doing the wrong thing, guys? <laughs> Then we have a long discussion, I think. <laughs> 
perhaps we can agree, maybe not. Maybe we can be agree that we don't know each other, we need each other, we don't reach each other in this topic, maybe. But we can have a discussion so I can listen, of course, and, we can li and they can listen to me, and sometimes we say that we can't be agree here. But also it's important just to listen. Okay. Anders, sometimes we say to me and Sorry. Well, my experience is that uh, um, politicians are often, often locked in their views from all, both sides. <laughs> and uh, if uh, researchers, are, researchers are coming to them with, uh, with new information, it's difficult to move. Uh, Outside from, the box, is yeah. that what you're talking about? Yeah. And the box is set f by values, norms? Yes, like values, or? norms, experience, or I don't know. The, mm. the, the voters in your Yeah, the voters, or the maybe, voters, or? yes. Mm. What is it, yeah? yeah. So how, how, how should science approach that? By uh, performing facts, by showing facts about it. So in the long term, uh, the truth and the facts are winning, of course. But do you, do you think that scientists understand the fact that the policymakers sometimes are within the box? No. <laughs> oh, okay. So how do we bridge that then? <laughs> do you, do you experience the same thing, Amanda? That boxing sort of... I think it depends. You can. I think it's just human nature. Scientists can do this as well. Um, we are only human. So I think on that human understanding, you can understand how people get um, set in their kind of um, set in their preferred paths or preferred solutions. Um, so I think it is bringing those facts, and it's just consistency of message over and over. Sometimes when we hear something the first time, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't quite sink in. Uh, so hearing that multiple ways uh, can be helpful too. Okay, yeah, multiple ways. I thought I was going to bring in some questions from Menti. Please help me out somebody um, who can give us a question. Do we have questions? Yes, here we are. David is up there. Uh, it's working, I think. Just go. Just keep talking. I think they're functioning. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, we have some questions here. Ellen, perhaps? Aha, okay, uh, then we have a problem. Okay, but so let's, have, let's bring it on and we'll hear these guys' reflection on this. All right, yeah. That. Maybe we can start with one for the, for the panel uh, yes, sitting please, here right do. now. Uh, so we have one here. Um, so the UNESCO guidelines for open science have one area called open dialogue with other knowledge systems. Uh, maybe if the panel can reflect on this, that's the question. Okay, open dialogue with other knowledge systems, was that the wording? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Does this ring a bell? <laughs> Hugo wants to go, please, Amanda. Uh, I'm not familiar with this um, specifically, but I think this is kind of a cornerstone. We've talked about transdisciplinary research and having this open dialogue um, and recognizing that there are a lot of different knowledge systems, not just uh, in research, not just knowing what policy is, but um, lots of different knowledge systems. Um, are out there. So I think if you are engaging in transdisciplinary research, this is probably something that you are very aware of and are trying to bring into your work. Um, no, and I also think that UNESCO has a very important role to discuss with other countries. We can talk about academic freedom, and then we have to talk it to other countries who don't have that. So mm -hmm. we have to have a, tell our opinion, of course, and listen to their other we are, which, which I think is a wrong uh, thing, they think. But I think it's very important to listen to other countries and other disciplinaries and other uh, knowledges. So I think it's very important. So UNESCO is very important with that, just to international discussion. Well, I think that it's important for the university to have uh, transdisciplinary uh, groups working like uh, Michael working at... Uh, uh, what they call climate. <laughs> yes, there are, there are different uh, p uh, people from different uh, disciplines working together, and and uh, and that's important if you want to design policy and if you are going to help policymakers. You have to have pol political science, chemistry, biology, everything in 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 the same discussion. So, so you're actually talking about both, you know, social sciences. Yes, and sciences, social science. Bridging yes. it. Uh. Yes to understand why people, why people react on def different policies and why some policies doesn't work because uh, people don't like uh, when it's not cheap to <laughs> fill up the car. <laughs> 
for example. Aspect, definitely. Mm -hmm. Anything else, David, from down here, or from the David, maybe? Yeah, we have some questions here. Uh, here's another one. Um, can there be career paths uh, for researchers, I assume, uh, where some uh, roles are being done more at a certain moment in their career uh, and where they have to um, sort of... Yeah, I, I was signed out here, sorry. <laughs> um, so, so actually, where career they have to paths for... Show how they construct their career, uh, taking these different facets into account. Okay, that's touching upon what you talked about, yeah, Amanda. I think you so, know. yeah, yeah. Is this beneficial for your university career or your science career, research career? So, I think people have made career paths out of um, sort of this more knowledge broker translation. I think it's a lot dependent on your setting your institution so my institution is very sympathetic to doing this work and very supportive yours is obviously as well we're both under stockholm university but other places not so much um, and in my experience a lot of people who do this they they kind of develop the love coming as a researcher and then develop the love for translating this so they find ways to make it work they find this little pot of funding or they find a synth sympathetic funder who will let them drop everything for two months to write a policy brief um, but i would love to see more formalized roles that are more widespread so you don't have to rely on your specific institution being very supportive of this, but you actually would have mobility uh, anywhere that you go. So how could uh, the parliament and support this? Would you agree? Is it necessary? Yeah, I think it's necessary. And uh, I just thinking how we can do it. Yes, yes, good. That's why I thought we were to Anders, so I can think about it. Okay, yeah, we yes, can yes. Well, uh, it. You mentioned policy brief. I think that's a uh, good thing. And the, the, the committees in the parliament should uh, reach out to the university and get the p more policy briefs and, and get the, uh, educational meetings where they can, they can learn more about different things in, in a policy level. So that's something they have to work more by. And also government people should meet uh, with. Uh, so the, it's a responsibility for the for political side also to, to reach out and, and get more information and get more knowledge. So maybe we have a time for you. Oh, there's a question I here as well. Yes, yes, please, of course. Yes. <laughs> maybe we can, get, we can get a mic there. Meanwhile, while we're waiting. Yes, please, Marit. Yes, we have we heard a little bit about the younger students here before, the academy of younger students. And that's very important for us to meet them, to hear um, their problems about how how they get salaries when they are do the researchers and how they can, if you can stay in Sweden to when they are working here after their PhD, for example. So I think we have lots of topics we can discuss with the students and researchers, of course, and the, how they can um, make it better, better life for them to make the students. That sounds promising. Please. Hello, Michael Satsanis from the Austrian Research Promotion Agency, but forget about it because the question is uh, coming from me uh, in my competence as a citizen. Um, I have a very provocative question and I apologize in advance if I step out of the very thin um, line of political and academic correctness. Um, we heard in the morning excellent examples, mostly though from the natural sciences, where a scientific consensus is more or less settled or even gold plated in the case of uh, climate science with the IPCC. What do we do with fields of science that um, scientific consensus or the truth is debatable or debated uh, that are uh, advising policy a lot? And I will make it concrete. Uh, um, uh, economic professors, I think the greatest majority of economic professors still believe in infinite growth in a finite system. Um, and it's not, I'm not saying that they are talking bullshit to, uh, to, um, to policy. They are stuck in, a, in their scientific paradigm, which is crumbling, but still they are re recognized academics publishing in their uh, scholarly um, venues. And they're giving advice to, to policies. How, what do we do <laughs> with these fields of science? Yes, thank you. So actually, what do we, how do we handle, because we've been touching upon this in the presentations, how do we handle when science is not united around one major um, opinion? You know, there are different opinions. What, what is your views on this? Yeah, I think in the work that we do, sustainability science, a lot of um, really social science, very transdisciplinary. Uh, so it often is not very 
clear cut. And so I think you need to be transparent. I think we've said this multiple times, transparent about what you know and what you don't know and what is fact and then what needs to be decided by society because it's based on value. So I think being transparent, like this is where I stand. I really, I really want to work towards sustainable food systems. That is, that is my value. That is my normative stance. That's where I'm coming from. Uh, be transparent and then, yeah, try, try as much as you can to say, this is the facts here, you know, here is the consensus or here is another competing field. And I think we've been talking about, you know, here are the pros and cons of different sides. So just kind of laying it out on that table is a start. Uh Time is running, this is so interesting, but I would like to give you a short, short final question. You can now decide everything. You are sort of the emperors or whatever. So what would you like to see happen tomorrow? I think Anders, you were already sort of on top of this. <laughs> yes. uh, environment surveillance. I think uh, the, the science must, must help uh, the politicians now because we are in really, difficult situation if you look at biodiversity. Uh, many things are happening now all over the world that is really worrying and uh, this, this science must help us to see this because if we see things early we might uh, react. Uh, the ecosystems are very complex and in the sea that you work with this extra complex and, and uh, small changes and small happenings can mean uh, catastrophe. In okay, so you're actually talking about so environment, science, science. monitoring, etc. Yes, that's so more, more money for that. More money for that, yes. Thank you. Uh, Marie-Louise? <laughs> and I can't uh, promise more money right now, <laughs> but I can take that we have more uh, closer and more uh, direct discussions with the science. So we can discuss the reality and we can meet, maybe I can to be uh, where you're working and follow your field and we're talking about environment, for example, so I can have more exact discussions and we can listen to each other. And I think that uh, make it easier to uh, make the right decisions. So Thank not you. more money, but better decisions. Thank you. Amanda, finally. Sure, I'll summarize just a few things that have already been said, but I think Again, creating these more specialized roles um, is very important, but also then the infrastructure around that. So we've talked about financing. So these aren't jobs that you do on top. These are actual additional jobs that require more resources. And then training. So this isn't just in universities for researchers who are already there. This is, as we've talked about, preparing students, masters, PhDs. What do you need to step into these roles? Some disciplines, uh, I've heard, we heard today, some are already prepared in this and others are are not prepared at all to step into this. Um, so I think it's not just creating that opportunity, but then having a lot of attractors, training, financing, um, good evaluation criteria, all of those things are also important. Thanks a lot, a warm applause I think for these guys. <laughs> so I will now leave the floor to the organizers again for 30 seconds of wrapping up, and you will very soon have a break. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. <laughs> working? Yes, it, it is working. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, what I'll tell now, I don't think as a wrap-up will be very shocking to you. Science and policy is not a marriage made in heaven. And there are many reasons for that, and Mikkel gave a lot of them, and, and we all understand them. This is not also a marriage of love, this is more marriage of convenience. But frankly speaking, in current words, we do not have choice. Science and policy needs to work together, and it's not only beneficial for both spouses here, but it's also beneficial for the third parties, like the society and our democracies. And we talked a lot, we used a lot of ideas and a lot of concepts how to make it better. We talked about trust, we talked about uh, bridging, we talked about, understand we talked about communication, we talked about uh, uh, specific institutional solutions, reform of the research assessment and so on and so forth. What we didn't talk too much, I think, is understanding. Understanding to avoid misconceptions. Understanding where is the limit of science, and this is a bit what Julian was saying in his presentation, where the role of the scientists ends, where the role of policymakers or politicians starts. But also understanding how we actually take the decision. I know we all try to think that we are rational people. 
uh, that we base our decisions on facts. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's not actually really truth. Facts are part of our decision-making process, but there are also other factors, values. Biases, we all bias. It's not the policymakers; they are biased. The scientists are also biased, and we had already hints about this uh, here. So without this basic understanding who we are, what is our role, how we behave, how we take the decision, we will not build trust. We will not reform anything, and we will not build bridges. So with this kind of uh, thought, I want to leave you, uh, and I'll give the floor now to my fellow I just want to say thank you. Uh, thanks to all the speakers. Thanks to the panel. Thanks to Gun for brilliant moderating. Uh, also a big sh thanks to uh, Wetenskap Almenhet and the technician for making this session run so smoothly. And of course, thank you for coming. So, great. <laughs>
Jo, nu känns det bra när jag får hjälp av er. Ska jag prata mer? Okej, okay, nu får jag. Tack! Toppen. Kanske... Being so alert, even though it's been now uh, two hours since the last uh, coffee break. <laughs> I'm the uh, Assistant Secretary General of the organization Public and Science VA, based here in Sweden. And during the next uh, 45 minutes here, we will focus on an aspect of open science that is not uh, usually as sort of explicit or top of mind as other aspects, such as uh, the sharing of data or open access to publications. So we'll talk about science communication and science engagement as uh, sort of enablers or drivers for uh, open science. Science communication here being understood as uh, communication and interaction with audiences outside uh, our sort of scientific peers. So it might be citizens or professional groups or policymakers, for example. And I see actually some really nice overlaps and uh, connections to the topics that were discussed in the previous session as well, that I'm sure that we will be able to come back to during this session. Uh, and we will hear from three different uh, policy initiatives uh, that are meant to stimulate uh, science communication in Europe or in different uh, national contexts uh, throughout this session. But we also would like to hear from you here in the audience, both you physically present here at the Museum of Natural History, but also from those of you who are joining us uh, all online from all over the world. So later during the session, we would like to hear from you and for you to share uh, inspiring initiatives that you know about that's happening in your local organizations or uh, national context. So you can start thinking about that already now. Uh, and you are also uh, able to ask uh, questions to the speakers throughout the session through uh, the Menti tool that is shown here on, on the slide. And uh, we have quite a tight schedule here before lunch, so I would like to already now present uh, uh, Lydia Damian Borrell, who is uh, Secretary General of the organization Science Europe. And she will join us in a pre-recorded video presentation, and she will tell us about the position statement that has been developed by Science Europe that is specifically concerned with the topic of uh, science communication. So, welcome, Lydia. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you at this important session on science and society, science communication and engagement enablers for open science. Apologies for not being able to be with you in person in the beautiful location of the Swedish Museum of Natural History. Today, we are here to discuss the importance of research culture and the value of open science, as well as the need for effective science communication and engagement. To begin, 
Let us frame this discussion within the context of our research culture values framework. As you may know, we have defined six values, one of which is openness and transparency. This value emphasizes the need for all aspects of research to be shared and accessible for the examination while respecting ethics and integrity. It also underlines the necessity that research process is appropriately explained and justified to relevant stakeholders at all levels. This value implies a profound discussion on the type of research culture that we want and acknowledges the responsibility of science and publicly funded research towards citizens. It is important to note that open science goes beyond open access to publications and it is a comprehensive ambition. I am here referring to the UNESCO recommendation on open science published last year. Science Europe and its members have defined two key objectives. I am referring here to our direction paper on open science published in June last year. First, we need to create an open and seamless collaboration between all actors involved in the research process. Second, we need to involve societal actors whenever relevant. This is where we forged a link between open science and science communication and engagement. Recently, some policy initiatives have drawn attention to global developments of open science. We cannot talk about open science without considering research assessment. A reform on research assessment is necessary to create an opening, more space for science communication and engagement. Assessment practices focus on scholarly publishing while communication and engagement can and should take the form of many more outputs that are not journal publications. For example, interactive maps as the result of citizen science projects measuring air quality. It does more for public debate than journal publications. The Coalition for Advancing Research Assessment, COARA, that you may have heard of, will address these issues. Let me then turn more to science communication again. At Science Europe, we envision a science communication system that considers science communication as an integral part of the research culture that we want to build and is based on open science and ethical standards. It should allow fluent communication and interaction with various audiences, including citizens and policymakers, and provide timely and contrasted evidence relevant to societal challenges to better inform societal debates and policy making. Science Europe work with its member organizations to strengthen their capacity to equip researchers with tools to communicate research and more effectively, and with high standards of ethics and integrity. Our position statement on open science communication published also in June 2022, aligns Science Europe member organizations in the initiation of actions, such as advocacy campaigns to build trust in science, partnerships with intergovernmental bodies to address misinformation and fake news, and institutional tools for researchers, such as toolkit and training activities. I would like to add a couple of more lessons learned. Discussions at the high-level workshop on the European Research Area in November 2022, hosted by the Swiss National Science Foundation, outlined some important aspects of science communication in the context of ethics and integrity. Communicating with a broader audience is crucial. Science communication should aim to explain scientific knowledge to the public in a transparent, honest and clear manner. It is important to communicate uncertainty here as well, which is an inherent to the scientific process. Public participation in research is also essential, and close interactions between researchers and the public can build trust and enhance the scientific process. For instance, the case of patient participation in research. In conclusion, we need to create a research culture that values more openness, transparency, ethical standards, open science, and effective science communication and engagement. Research organizations, therefore, should fully integrate science communication in their programs and activities and consider them as crucial elements of the quality and value of researcher for all. 
Advocating this vision will be the goal of a high-level conference on science communication that we are planning uh, on 12th and 13th March 2024 under the Belgian presidency of the EU Council. I look forward to see you all there and in the meantime and specifically for today I wish you a great discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Lydia. And now I would like to directly introduce uh, Anna Maria Fleetwood from the Swedish uh, Research Council that is part of Science Europe. And you have been uh, involved in development of this position paper and can tell us a bit more about that. Welcome. Thank you, Gustav. So, um, great. Let's have the first picture. There. Uh, great science doesn't speak for itself. Uh, it is critical that science, scientific evidence is readily available and easy to understand. Government, businesses and citizens are demanding more of such uh, evidence to make informed decisions and to act. And fundamental changes in how information is uh, communicated through uh, the media have created uh, opportunities to information, but it has also opened uh, doors to miss and disinformation. So I would like to thank uh, Lydia and Science Europe uh, uh, to because of their support uh, uh, in for the working group uh, uh, to take on the task to writing a position paper. Uh, on science communication. I would also like to acknowledge that science communication is an important part of research culture and open science. It was a pure delight to work with Science Europe. Uh, I think this paper is utmost important, both in EU uh, and globally. I would just briefly uh, go through the framework actions. Uh, Lydia was touched upon some of them uh, from the position paper uh, that we identified together uh, can contribute to foster science communication. So uh, the first one is strengthen the role uh, that research institutions have on science communication. Uh, this is to include, involve researchers in the development of communication outputs uh, and processes. And shifting from focus on the individual scientist toward making it a part of a collective work. Create pan-European opportunities. Uh, to develop awareness, uh, enhance relevance, and build trust in science, uh, such as uh, European-wide social media campaigns uh, and events within EU institutions. Uh, we heard Lydia was talking about a conference that is planned, or high-level conference that is planned in the beginning of next year. Build um, partnership with science communication stakeholders. Uh, and intergovernmental bodies uh, that are already active uh, in science communi communication. That means to work with actors already in the sectors and not keep it in silos. Develop institutional tools for researchers to better communicate research. Uh, this includes uh, uh, creating toolkits and guidelines, organizing training, uh, uh, activities, training and activities for researchers, acknowledging scientists uh, for the communication work, uh, and incorporating communication plans uh, into strategic plans of institutions, research groups, and projects. Employ new and diverse forms of knowledge communication to improve the quality uh, of science communication, keeping abreast with latest tools and trends in communication, uh, in the communication sphere, such as improved knowledge of communication practices uh, should, that should be used to support scientists 
who must remain the crucial actors undertaking science communication. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna Maria, and we will hear more from you in a short while during a discussion after the presentations. But now I would like to present a guest that is joining us uh, online. And we heard a lot about uh, uh, the importance of trust during the previous session. That this is also one of the pillars within the position statement of Science Europe. And now we will meet uh, Miss Barbara Schrotter who is a policy advisor at the Austrian Federal Ministry of Education, Science and Research. And the ministry in Austria has developed a 10-point program to increase public trust in science and research in Austria. And Barbara will tell us more about this program. So welcome, Barbara. I'm pleased to be with you. Uh, and hello from rainy Vienna. <laughs> to Stockholm. Unfortunately, I um, just came back from Brussels and can only join you online. But thank you very much for the, for the very kind introduction. I, I would um, like to jump directly into the topic. So you all or we all remember the 2021 Special Europe Parameter Survey um, and in general, there was a positive overall picture, but in Austria, as it was also in some other countries, um, this is the results have caused lots of discussion and these discussions are still ongoing. On the one hand side, we see a high level of skepticism. And on the other hand side, those of you in the community who followed the events also know, um, and let me, I hope you can see the presentation. I can see it here on the screen. Do you see the, the slides? Yeah, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, yes, and on the other hand side, there was lot, lots of uh, proud, pride and, and joy um, in our country when uh, quantum physics Anton Zeilinger was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics in December. So even the newspapers titled, uh, we are Nobel Prize, and uh, there was like uh, a wave of enthusiasm going over the whole country. But how does this fit together? Zeilinger himself gave a very interesting explanation why uh, in our country skepticism um, in science is, is, is very high. Uh, and he said that too little, and uh, people explain too little and um, too little well uh, about science. And he also sees uh, part of the responsibility in media, um, and uh, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, it was really a big issue that whenever there was a professional majority opinion about uh, the situation, about the crisis, um, there was always, they were always looking for this one expert who had a different opinion and, and gave this um, a, big, um, a, a big spot in, in the media. So this unsettled people as well. And um, there was, I think, the highest point and also all the, all the surveys show that during this period of time, um, it, the, there was the biggest insecurity. Um, and since taking office, our Minister for uh, Education, Science and Research, Martin Polaschek, uh, he was also, he's also a former professor for legal history. And he knew the survey already from his former job as a rector of the University of Graz. And he made it his task uh, to take action against the skepticism in Austria. So to this end, he initiated, initiated not only a strategy, but we also operationalized this with a, this 10-point program. Um, and it's a program not only about um, to strengthen trust in science, but also in democracy. Why democracy? Um, democracy, science and research, and the trust in science and research uh, is a cornerstone 
for our whole democratic society. So all the decisions or many of the decisions made by politicians are based on science. And this is why uh, it's also so important to impart an understanding of science and its achievements in our everyday lives and already starting from school. So um, for the focus of the strategy is along the entire education chain starting uh, with children, pupils, teachers, scientists, the universities, and of course, all our partners, the research institutions. And since this uh, survey in 2021, many activities started in Austria and there are groups of, of scientists and communicators um, doing so. So as a first step in the ministry, of course, uh, we went in to see what do the others who achieved better results in the 2021 survey. Um, and we would also like to especially thank our Swedish hosts for making this topic as a priority of the Swedish EU presidency. So, um, yeah. <laughs> um, let me start with, with our 10-point program. Um, we do not know the exact reasons why the trust in Austria is so low. So there are only estimations, but for this reason, the ministry uh, commissioned a study from the Institute for Advanced Studies together with the University of Aarhus in Denmark. Um, and this study examines the historic, socioeconomic, systematic, and also structural dimensions of the situation in Austria. And we already received the first interim report. And it's very interesting because probably it's not so much the skepticism, but it's more about the interest, the lack of interest um, that might be a cause for these results. But the results of the survey uh, will finally be available at the end of August and of course we will inform you also and this will also be the basis for further recommendations for actions in Austria. Um, we see in other countries like for example um, Portugal which is, that is like uh, the pioneer in this field for 25 years um, that uh, in these best practice examples that all these countries have uh, a certain structure and uh, the, this is why we also want to establish uh, this structure in Austria but we see that it's also differently from country to country and existing uh, community structures have to be taken into account so this pr process is currently ongoing um, we also do have a large number of offers in the field of science and democracy education in Austria, which includes many institutions that are now dealing with the topic. So this is why um, we want to make this um, easily accessible. And uh, the University of Technology of Graz is working on a technical solution uh, in the framework of a project in order to make these available. So uh, on a website with certain categories um, and as a first step, our Agency for International Affairs and Education has made a collection of about 500 offers to make them available on the web website uh, for schools. Um, yeah, the next topic is we want to focus on the expansion and strengthening of cooperation and uh, one of the four, um, it's so important to bring all the players together to bring science to schools, universities, research institutions, central institutions in the field of democracy, like for example, parliament, memorial sites, courts, national parks. So um, one um, of our activities in this field, for example, is to focus on target groups that have less affinity with science. And for example, we reach out to 14 to 15 year old school um, pupils that will most probably not continue uh, to attend school. So it's, it's one of the last chances um, in the, within the school system uh, to bring them closer to science. 
and uh, we are preparing and organizing science weeks in June uh, for these special schools. Yeah, and to reach out to the schools um, is, is a high priority for us. So therefore, we also established a network of contacts in all the nine federal states um, to reach out with information to the schools. Uh, another project ongoing, um, we established science and democracy ambassadors. Uh, what is this? So there, is, there are scientists, they go to schools and talk about their work, their career, how they came, what is their motivation, um, and also to, to bring their enthusiasm to the kids. And the number of these ambassadors, we have about 300 now, and it's uh, constantly increasing. I will now um, go to the next point. Uh, it's about the teachers' training. Teachers' training is also very important to us because um, we also need to embed this into, um, into the, the teachers. Also uh, into the curricula, our focus is not only on the scientists, but we also want to start with the students and to anchor the topic in the, of science communications in their, um, in their uh, curricula. So every student and every researcher has to, be, uh, has to explain what science is and what it brings to everyday life in a very simple way. Um, and how do we bring, how do we get people um, to be science ambassadors, for example, or to do more science communications? So we need to create incentives for our researchers. Uh, they need to have opportunities and the freedom to do so, to get more involved in schools, to do more science communication. And uh, to, to do this and to, to do this performance, we need on the one hand side incentives, but on the other hand side also support the employers, like the universities, uh, the research institutions. And there are already discussions ongoing on European level about um, evaluating differently the performance in science and research. And also at the national level, uh, we want to include this into the agreements with the university, for example. Yeah, and the last point, of course, uh, I started at the beginning with the role of the media, so they are also a very important partner to us uh, when it comes to, to communication. Sorry, <laughs> I could talk for hours about this uh, to us very important topic and thank you for giving me the opportunity and I'm looking very much forward also to the other comments. Thank you very much, Barbara. I think this is a really unique uh, initiative coming from the uh, minister's side, but with the respect of time, we will go straight to our next guest here today, coming from uh, the Netherlands, where they have launched a very new national center for uh, science communication. And Alex, uh, Alex uh, Verkad, who is uh, head of communication and positioning at the Regiorgan SIA, is here to tell us more about this. So welcome, Alex. Just waiting for the sound. Um, thank you very much uh, for, for having me. I, I think it's very nice that at a conference that is about open science, you also pay some attention to science communication, because as you said, those are two separate fields uh, of people in the world, while at the same time, the subjects are very close together and overlap uh, a lot. I still see the slide of Barbara. I don't know what you are seeing. Maybe I should, oh, this is my first. Um, so the National Center of Expertise on Science and Society um, in the Netherlands is in fact so new that it hasn't started yet. We have, uh, Jonica Smeets and I have spent the past half year um, on an assignment from the Ministry of Science to come up with a, with a plan. That plan is launched. You see a QR code on the screen um, that will lead you to the uh, English summary. We have, unfortunately, we don't have the whole plan in English yet maybe feel free to translate it 
Um, but we do have a summary and, um, and a theory of change in English. So feel free to download it and share it as widely as possible. Um, oh, I'm now pressing the keys on my keyboard, but I should use this app on my phone to go to the next slide. It is, it is connecting. Um, we are struggling. Yes, there it is. So I only have uh, five minutes now. I will, uh, I, I have chosen to give you a very short sketch of what this center is going to be and what it's going to do. Of course, there's a lot more to tell, but I hope you will ask uh, the questions that you will, would like to have answered uh, later on. So this is the um, mission of the center that is going to start somewhere later this year. Um, it will be uh, a national center that will not have uh, a direct link with the with the publics, but instead will help researchers and all other people doing science communication to do that better. Uh, and the end goal would be a better society uh, through better connections through uh, between science and society. Um, I would like to show the, the next slide, but my app is not really working. So if someone can, yes, thank you very much. So we have, uh, in the past half year, we have talked to over 400 people in the Netherlands and also abroad, some of the national centers um, that Barbara also mentioned. Uh, for example, in Portugal, we also spoke to, and in England and in Germany, um, but mostly a lot of people in the Netherlands from the science um, uh, community. Um, and we came up with an advice and, uh, for a national center about science communication. So what is it going to be? Our Minister of um, Culture, Education and Science has um, budgeted uh, 10 million euros in total for the next 10 years, so 1 million euro a year. Um, we have um, uh, advised, and the advice has been, uh, has been uh, uh, accepted, to um, establish a center that will have five people working in it. It launches later this year. Um, it will be uh, an independent foundation, so it will not be run by the ministry, it will not be run by a university, and it will not be run by a, uh, any other existing organization in the field of in the Netherlands uh, to ensure its, um, its independence. So it will be an independent foundation that will have a small uh, board in which a number of people will be uh, representing uh, different aspects of, of the science uh, ecosystem. And we'll have a large steering group to involve uh, citizens, all kinds of uh, organizations doing science communication and also more representatives of the science uh, uh, ecosystem. So just to sketch what this center will look like and what it will spend its money on, uh, uh, mostly on, on people and a little bit of, uh, uh, on activities. I'm pressing my phone, so I hope someone sees that and will Yes. So this is very small and um, very small letters and a very big uh, sheet of text. I, I only want to show you this uh, because uh, we are proud of it. And um, it is also in the English uh, translation. Good QR code. But this um, is a form of theory of change that we developed uh, with all, uh, all these people that we talked to, to, uh, to make clear how very small activities from our national center can lead through a number of, um, of uh, consequences to what you see at the top of this, of this schedule, a, a future-proof society with equality and with um, uh, science uh, able to take its responsibility um, to contribute to a better world. Um, I don't expect anyone to read all of this right now. It's just to show you that there is, um, uh, that this is there and, and I would love to invite you to uh, read this and, and use it any way you would like to um, translate it. And, uh, and we based our advice on, uh, on this. So practically, the, the first question that a lot of people ask when I talk about the center is, what is it going to do? Um, and I always start uh, my answer by telling people what it's not going to do. Um, our national center is not going to do science communication activities itself. It's not going to translate science to the public. It's not going to organize festivals. It's not going to do journalism. It's, it's not going to educate um, society. Um, why not? Because there is already a lot of great stuff going on. And there, there is so much science communication going on in the Netherlands that it would not help to add more. 
uh, what we are going to do is help people make that science communication that is already happening uh, better. And better means uh, have more, make it have more impact for the time and money that is spent on it. Uh, make it more of a dialogue instead of just sending information. Um, make it more accessible for uh, everyone in society, not just people who happen to be close to science, either physically or through their education or through the networks, um, and a number of different ways. What the center is also not going to do is supply funding to science communication projects. Um, the easy argument is that the budget is too low for that. We have 1 million euros a year. We could not really fund um, uh, a number of big projects meaningfully. Another reason is that there is already funding for science communication, a little bit. Um, what we are going to do is um, co-create policies and also co-create these, these funding opportunities for science communication um, through other parties that already fund this stuff. Um, and what the center is also not going to do is um, train scientists or train practitioners to do better science communication. Also for the reason that these trainings already exist. Um, the problem is not that they don't exist. The problem is that people don't find them because they are small. They're sometimes only for people in, the, in, in, in one faculty or one university. What this center is going to do is, uh, is find those trainings, know the people who get, who, deliver them and make sure they will be more accessible to more practitioners of science communication. Um, that, that will be okay for now, I think. The center is going to do a lot more. That's, that's all in the report. Unfortunately for you, it's all in Dutch. Um, anyone who would, again, who would be willing to translate this, uh, this stuff would be more uh, than welcome to do so. Um, so as promised, I, uh, I kept it very short. This was, my, uh, this, this was a very short introduction of what we are going to do later this year. And I hope you um, will ask me any and all questions that you would like to have answered today or later on. My contact uh, information will probably be somewhere in the proceedings. Great. Thank you very much, Alex. And we're really following the development of this uh, national center with huge interest here from Sweden and I know from a lot of other parts of Europe and the world as well. Um, so we have now just about 10 minutes uh, to go of this uh, session and I would like to invite Anna Maria to come up back here on stage. And as I said in the beginning of the session, we'd love to hear about, because these now are three really impressive, I think, policy initiatives uh, from different parts uh, meant to stimulate science communication. But we would love to hear about uh, more initiatives that you know of that are sort of off the top of our radar. So you can go into Menti again now and feel free to add uh, your uh, thoughts on this topic. And uh, I hope that we will also be able to see whatever you uh, uh, put in there uh, up here on the screen, also visible for Barbara and uh, Alex. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, I thought that I would uh, find some questions that have been sent in through Menti for the speakers. See if I can find the, a question that sort of tags into all of your presentations here. Uh, so, for example, I mean, the overall theme of this conference is uh, open science, whereas during this session we specifically talk about the aspect of science communication and involving uh, other professional groups than scientists uh, within science. And where do you sort of see the relationship between these two concepts, science communication and open science? Lydia was uh, sort of uh, elaborating a bit on this in her presentation. But uh, what would you say, Alex? Oh, I, I would say that um, open science for me is about um, access and, and exchange, in a way. Um, uh, and as Lydia said, I, I very much agree with that. That doesn't uh, begin and end with, um, uh, you know, open access to scientific publications. Um, access is much more than not having to uh, pay for uh, for articles. Access is also understanding what is in them, um, being able to talk to scientists about the results and stuff like that. So I, <clears throat> I would say that science communication 
could very much be an, an aspect or a contribute to the, the higher goals of, of open science. Great, thank you. Uh, Barbara, do you have any thoughts on, on the topic, on the relationship between open science and science communication? Yeah, for me, they are also interlinked because, uh, yeah, science has to be open, but it also has to be uh, communicated in a way that everybody can understand and it, that uh, it causes also interest and enthusiasm about it. So I, I see this, these two topics uh, very important together. Thanks a lot, important together. And Anna Maria, would you like to add something? No, um, I think that this was one of the, the, the aims and the goals with uh, organizing this conference to really broaden the knowledge about uh, open science and uh, get away from the focus a little bit, uh, uh, that it's not just publications and, and data. And uh, hopefully we had uh, sort of added s some more uh, aspects of open science. Uh, and I also think that this is really clearly stated in the recommendations from the UNESCO, where it's really included the public engagement as part of open science. Uh. And another theme of the conference is going from policy to practice. And all of these three initiatives that we heard about are really nice, I think, uh, policy initiatives, even though, I mean, the, uh, the Dutch National Center is uh, now coming into practice, uh, in a way, uh, being materialized. But, uh, for example, with a position paper in Science Europe and uh, uh, the 10 point program for increased trust in Austria. How do you see what are the sort of important factors for putting these policies into actual practice? What is needed? What do you say, Anna Maria? I think um, it was important and it's important that uh, everyone in the working group has taken this position paper back to the organizations. Uh, and it has been discussed within the, the, the organization at the highest level. And I mean, this is not something that we change overnight, but I think that every time we speak about science communication uh, in, in sort of sense of policy, I think we sort of contrib contribute to uh, a better and a broader understanding that this is part of the scientific process, as also Lydia, Lydia uh, pointed out. Great, thanks. And uh, uh, Barbara, how do you envision from the Austrian perspective uh, the rolling out in practice, so to say, this 10-point uh, program? Absolutely. Uh, you, and you see, we have a very operational focus program. Uh, but of course, in, within the process or during this process, we see uh, the 10 points, this, our process is not finished with them. So we are already talking about uh, further steps going beyond this. And, and of course, um, I, can, or, I can, can sign everything that was said also by Lydia and Anna Maria. And I'm also very interested in, in how it will go on in the Netherlands with Alex and their project. Thanks a lot. I would also like to repeat the, the Menti code for submitting uh, uh, your views on uh, initiatives that you know about. The code is 59147979, as you can see here on the screen. And uh, I don't know if we have any submissions as of yet that we could view on the screen. Uh, if not, uh, I thought that, uh, I mean, going from policy to... Yeah, here we have some uh, initiatives actually coming up here. Can you see this as well, Barbara and um, uh, Alex? Yeah. I see this, yes. Transdisciplinary yes. thematic collaboration it? initiatives going on at Lund University here in the southern Sweden. <clears throat> We also have a wanted point here, connecting citizen science with schools. 
and creating not only communication materials for education, but for wider public. Why not making TV shows? It's a good idea. That's right. <laughs> we are also in, in close touch, for example, with, with the media, with, with public television, um, and they, are, they also have a great interest in bringing more science into yeah. their programs. Great. You're uh, really welcome to continue to submit this and we will also be able to share this with you after the, the conference and after the session. One last question before we end here, because we talked about going from policy into practice and I guess the next step would be going from practice to some sort of impact. And then I'm interested in what sort of impacts are you uh, envisioning uh, when it comes to your initiatives. I mean, one impact could be, of course, increasing public trust in science. Another impact could be uh, increased scientific literacy. And uh, yeah, I guess there are many different types of impacts that you would like to see. And if you would just like to very, very short uh, elaborate a bit on what types of impacts do you personally see for your uh, different uh, initiatives. So we can start with Alex. Yeah. Um, well, we've 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 put that down in the report as well in in a very elaborate way. But I will I will keep it very short. We would like to um, what we think science communication can do is help people um, uh, make better decisions for themselves in their lives because the world is very scientific uh, uh, and it's very important to know what goes on. Um, uh, but also to um, uh, to make sure that um, scientists and non scientists can work together to. Uh, to solve these big, uh, complex uh, issues that are facing us um, uh, with climate change and people in societies getting older and older, especially in, in, in Dutch societies, um, and, other, um, and other major complex problems that, that cannot be solved by science alone, that cannot be solved by citizens alone, but we have to work together and combine all, this, all the forms of knowledge that we have. Super. Thanks, Alex. Uh, it's actually uh, closing to uh, lunch here at 12 o'clock and we will soon be able to have something to eat outside here. But uh, before that, I will need to introduce uh, uh, Lisa Monson, who is the director here of the Natural History Museum. And uh, uh, you will tell us a bit of what happens during lunch, but also after lunch here. That's true. Uh, so we will continue in this room until three o'clock this afternoon. So I hope that many of you are planning to stay. Um, the finale will be that we have the Minister for Culture um, talking to us on the subject. Uh, that will be very interesting. But before that, we'll have different perspectives on how um, uh, different um, European networks are working together to foster science and make that available. And we also have some examples from both Science Centers and Natural History Museum, both this that you're visiting today and the one in Copenhagen. So that is coming up after lunch. And for lunch, I just want to let you know that the tables are set right outside this room. So you can just go up to the counter and say that you're part of this uh, conference and they will uh, serve you a hot meal of vegetarian food. Thanks a lot, Lisa, and thank you very much to Anna Maria and Barbara and Alex for, I think, extremely interesting presentations of initiatives and an intense uh, discussion. Uh, so, thank you very much for all of your contributions here today.
Okay, I, I believe that we are ready to run. Perfect. Okay, welcome back. Uh, both you that are participating online and digitally, and those ga here gathered in the room at the Swedish Natural History Museum. Uh, the theme for the afternoon, let me show you. It's uh, accessibility to an involvement in science. And uh, we have divided the afternoon into two different panel discussions that will be very interesting and exciting to, to listen into. And I'm, I'm sure that it will also be possible to ask questions. So please use the Menti functionality to send in your questions. And the moderator here to lead the discussion is uh, Christine sundberg Karendi. And you are the Secretary General for the Swedish Science Centers, and it's a, a pleasure to have you here. So please take this forward. Welcome. Thank you, um, Lisa. Uh, and the Swedish Science Center Association is pleased to be a partner to this uh, conference today. And I have the privilege to work with 20 science centers around Sweden. And we, uh, we would like to give everyone the opportunity to increase their science capital. And if you're not familiar with the concept of science capital, you will hear more about that very soon. And regardless of background, everyone should get the chance to increase their knowledge in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And we would like to lift our contribution to society from a holistic perspective, not the traditional silos that we can see within politics and public administration. We open doors through STEM. By adding an A, as in arts, we open up for people with other initial interests. Uh, as you can see, all parts are interlinked, and science communication, of course, has a very clear connection to lifelong learning. And as we could hear before lunch, unfortunately, there's no lack of uh, challenges around us. We need to secure democratic societies as well as sustainable futures. And science communication and science engagement are key in many of those challenges. And before lunch, we had the focus on policy and some practice, and now we'll have even more focus on practice. Because museums and science centers are important actors when it comes to engaging citizens in science. And this afternoon, we will start by addressing how we secure accessibility to science, and what best practice can we share in how to create science involvement and engagement. A warm welcome to everyone in the room, as well to those who participate online. And you're all welcome to send your questions and comments uh, through Menti. And um, we, uh, you'll see, soon see the code, and it will be here throughout. We will also open up for, uh, for questions from you in the room a little bit later on. And um, I would like to welcome our first panelists. Please welcome up uh, the three of you. And welcome, uh, I'll start in the back, Peter uh, Sikiago, your director of the Natural History Museum of Denmark. Welcome to Stockholm. Thank you. And I wonder, for your own lifelong learning, is there a certain place that you prefer to go to when you feel the need for um, experience-based learning? And you cannot choose your own museum. <laughs> I go to my own museum often enough. Uh, and I do like to go to natural history museums. In fact, our children, they regularly tell me that uh, they grew up in natural history museums. But where I really like to go are places that challenge my thinking, places that are good at reaching out to communities that we don't or rarely see at, uh, at museums or in cultural institutions. 
institutions, organizations that are engaging with these communities, bringing them in, making them not visitors, but part of the family. And from my perspective, we have a lot to learn between different cultural institutions. The world is connected. The natural world is connected. Our cultural worlds are connected. But we've been very good at separating those different worlds into different disciplinary sectors, including, which is, is also reflected in all of our cultural institutions. We should work far more together. We should look to each other, be inspired by each other. So from my perspective, it's interesting to see what are they doing in art museums of engaging with their community. Is there anything that we can learn? And uh, to engage with our communities, could we bring our communities together? Because I don't believe that these are and should be separate communities. So to answer your questions, everywhere. <laughs> yeah. I'll try to, to get another answer for you later on <laughs> as well. Uh, Karina Hallward, you're CEO of Universium in Gothenburg. And uh, I know that you have a, a very clear view of your lifelong learning. You, you change areas uh, quite often and you go deep. You're serious about it too. Yeah. A couple of years ago it was tennis. And now I know you recently bought a grand piano. Yes. Is that for pure pleasure when you get a feeling, or do you have a goal? Well, yeah, I do have a goal, to, to stay curious. And that's why I, I try to challenge myself on a regular basis to learn new things. And started off turning 50 when I started my own rock band. I can recommend that, to learn uh, to play how to play guitar and to do stage dive. That was fantastic. And then on to tennis, as you said. And now my, my latest uh, passion is actually to to regain the capacity to, to play the piano. So I bought a mini grand piano and I do have a goal. I hope my sons are not listening because it's a secret. Uh, I do want to play when they marry. Uh, for the, one, the youngest son, I'd like to play Nothing Else Matters, you know, Metallica song, but in a classical way. And uh, for my older sons, I have another song until I found it, and I'd like to sing to that as well. So, my God, it's a challenge. But yeah, it drives me forward, it gives me energy, and it challenges me in new ways that work life doesn't do. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Sebastian Quith, you are a director of research and collections here at the museum. And uh, when I did some research before this session, I saw on LinkedIn that you are a leech enthusiast. Leech enthusiast, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and that triggered my uh, wish for lifelong learning. So I would like to ask yeah. you for um, the elevator pitch for leeches. And yeah, it's, that's uh, right. Only a two-story high elevator. That's right, a very quick one. Um, yeah, you know, in, in lieu of becoming a rock star, I became a leech enthusiast. Um, and I think those are, are, are at the same level in society, I think. Um, yeah, I studied, my research background uh, allowed me to, to study blood feeding leeches and the evolution of, of those. And I think uh, this is the strength of, of science and research and engagement, uh, is that something that can be so very esoteric to a lot of people um, is someone else's real passion. And therein lies the challenge, but also the opportunity, is to engage people in something that is so far away from, from what they might know, um, but that can help and, uh, and benefit them in their everyday lives, I think, is, is a challenge, especially for a leech enthusiast. Thank you. I think I stuck to the interest there, yeah. Um, thank you so much, and welcome all of you. Um, I would like to start with you, Peter, for a short introduction, and you will get the, the clicker here. Mm -hmm. And Karina and Sebastian, if you want to see um, this pre presentation, you have some high chairs over there. So, uh, what I would like to talk to you about uh, this afternoon is uh, the con concept or the question of natural history museums for the future. And one of the things that we, that we need to uh, address is the question of relevance. Why are natural history museums relevant? Why do we meet for such a conference at a natural history museum? And the claim that I would want to make is that natural history museums have never been more important. The world is changing. Uh, we've had 
several people addressing this issue uh, today, and we have to adapt to that, uh, um, to that changing world. We need to think about how we, as naturalist museums, can be relevant, how we can continue to provide value to society and to our, to our citizens, and the situation that, uh, that, that we're in today calls upon action. It calls upon cultural institutions taking a larger, a bigger responsibility than what we've, uh, what we've had done previously. Natural history museums have changed during the centuries from curiosity cabinets, uh, uh, collections, uh, to the monumental repositories, uh, to science centres, public education centres, biodiversity centres. The question is, do we need to be something different today? Now we are at, we are entering the second quarter of uh, the 21st uh, century. It's not enough just to think about us as 21st century um, institutions. We are indeed entering the second quarter and uh, things are happening on this planet uh, that needs to be addressed. All the things that we have experienced and learned during the pandemic that health of that human health and, uh, the, and nature's health are deeply uh, connected is a lesson that we cannot and uh, must not forget. Another thing that we must not forget from, uh, from the pandemic is the fact that if we do stand together and if we do work together as a global community we can make a difference and the, and the planet really needs, uh, really needs this. We can be centres for change and natural history museums, we can be platforms for informed discussions as indeed we are today, we can be inclusive and, uh, and diverse, we can be places, platforms, uh, where people can meet across differences uh, and have this serious discussion about the world that, uh, that we share. It's also, from our perspective, about open science and open science for, uh, for everyone. Scientific knowledge has no value in itself. It needs to be communicated, needs to be used. And we need, as we heard this, uh, this morning, indeed to democratise our knowledge and to make our natural history collections accessible to everyone across, uh, across the globe. We don't see this as national collections at natural history museums. We see this more and more, uh, we see ourselves more and more as guardians of a global uh, natural heritage that we need to maintain, preserve, but also make accessible so it can be used by everyone and should be accessible by anyone. Uh, we cannot do this uh, on our own, which is why um, among all the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals, number 17 is the most important uh, uh, for me. We need to collaborate, not just between museums, cultural institutions, but uh, to bring stakeholders uh, together. Again, natural history museums are perfectly situated to bring stakeholders together who might be more territorially, territorial, uh, traditionally, but we can provide that neutral platform and we need that engaged uh, uh, conversation, conversation. And major museums, uh, such as national naturalist museums, like, uh, like this museum, like our museums, we have major responsibilities and we need to take that responsibility uh, upon us. For us, it's about positive change for people and, uh, and planet by promoting a scientific understanding of the natural uh, in natural world, to make people, to give people tools uh, to make uh, to make real change in uh, in in their uh, in their lives, 
we are facing a serious situation. We've heard about this uh, earlier during this conference, uh, of, uh, facts versus opinion, and inf information overload, lack of tr uh, trust in scientific institutions and authorities, etc. And this is increasing, and we need to do something, uh, something about it. It also uh, adds into the hectic living, a, f a feeling of hectic pace, if a lot of things are going on on, uh, uh, on um, electronic media, on social media. Um, and we need to be able to provide for everyone a, a break of opportunities of engaging uh, in real questions, in solutions to the major problems that, to, that we are facing. Um, for that purpose, we're building a new museum in Copenhagen, uh, supporting our vision of connecting people and nature, which is what it's all about for us. It's about connections, connections between people and nature, but also connections between people. In the Botanic Garden, centre of uh, Copenhagen, two storeys underground with uh, new permanent uh, galleries, connecting, creating an all-new uh, vision for how the everything in the natural world is connected and that we as humans are not separate from the natural world but we are part of it. We're one big connected network of people and uh, the rest of the natural world. Looking forward to visit this new uh, museum as well. And Karina, um, the floor is yours. Here we go. All right, thank you. Uh, well, your museum is part of the community that uh, Christine addressed earlier, the 20 science centers throughout Sweden. And we opened in 2001, and I'd like to start by giving credit to our founders and to the Swedish government at the time that uh, made sure that we were formed and based on the true quadruple helix model uh, that we do in our, on a daily basis have the support from our founders, the academia through Chambers University and Technology and the University of Gothenburg, the public sector through the region of Gothenburg and the business community through the West Sweden Chamber of Commerce. And also that the government at the time realize the fact that we need to be interdisciplinary. So we had the support from the Minister of Economy and the Minister of Environment. They together uh, gave us the assignment to be a national science center and to address sustainability from start in 2001. And I wish, are there any politicians left in the room? Yes, Lena. Perfect. <laughs> to you and all you who are online, I wish for you to, to just to give us science centers and museums this assignment on a long-term basis and make the conditions strong for us to, to, be, uh, to do this work. Um, there is something that we all together need to do on a daily basis in order for us to create science engagement and involvement. And that needs to start with increasing, building the science capital in the society. Because it's not until each individual has a strong science capital that they truly can engage in, in complex science and technology. And I know this crowd, you know that this is normally uh, put together in eight bullet points. I've shortened it down to four. It, it, uh, it's about science you know, that you really understand what is science, how does it work, uh, what skills do I need. It, it's about how you think about science. Do you think it's relevant in your daily life? Do you see the utility of it? It is what you do. Uh, take, for example, your media consumption. Do you actually read science uh, articles? Do you look in social media on science articles? Do you watch TV programs and so forth? And it's also about who you know, who is actually, who you really know, that is close to you, a relative, a friend, someone in the community that is actively involved in science, so that, and also encourages you to continue on that path. So this is you know, sort of the, the, the total science capital, and we need to be in that. That's actually what we do, all of us together, on a daily ba basis. And again, please give us the structure 
uh, sort of the, system, the political system to support us doing that, because without that, we can never create science en engagement. And uh, I'm going to give you four examples on how we, what we can do more. And the examples are from Universium, but I know they resonate with what my colleagues uh, throughout the country and otherwise do. Uh, one thing we need to do is to actually challenge ourselves. Uh, as we heard before from Peter, the, the society is complex and it's growing more and more complex. And that demands us to work in new ways. So we need to develop our methods continuously. And for example, here we had a, a it started as a, as a project to learn. We call it the power of youth. We had a holistic view on how can we make sure that more students pass um, exit from the primary school with passing grades so that they can move on in the educational system and that they can actually get a job on forward in life. In Sweden, approximately one out of four doesn't do this. And there are areas as this one where we started our work where three out of four students didn't pass primary school with, with passing rates. Uh, so we had a holistic view. We worked with the parents, we worked with all school staff, we worked with all students from age 6 to 16 uh, in a sort of um, a systematic way and simultaneously to see how will this ad actually... Um, uh, oh, I didn't... Sorry. How can this um, help the, the students? And after four years, we saw that the teachers, as well as the parents, were f uh, reinforced in their roles, supporting the kids. The students themselves gained confidence and actually learned more. And, uh, and we saw that in, in four years, the, the number increased from 27% of the kids to 47% of the students leaving primary schools with passing rates. So having these holistic views, understanding that you need to work with all these different uh, people simultaneously will, will, um, will, help, will help the issue. And we've implemented this uh, method now in our daily work. Another example is to t take this method and uh, or then broaden the reach uh, going from the school to the municipality. And now we are working with several municipalities, my God, that word in English, municipalities. And they have uh, engaged for a number of years from forward where they together, oh my goodness, um, uh, address uh, learning for sustainable development. And here we as a science center can act as process leaders and competence enablers, where we meet these different parties over and over again, over, over, over time, and we make them talk with each other. And that creates some, some sort of science engagement. Third example is that uh, we also, as a science centre, can work cross community together with others, with healthcare services, with social services, with the police, and so forth. And we do that as well in the city of Gothenburg, seeing great results doing that. That is us doing more for science engagement. And the last example is throughout these different methods, of course, we as science centre, we can do more by integrating new technology. We still have hands-on experiences, but we also need to integrate new technology. And when we want to close the gap between research data and us citizens, we need to enable us to understand these complex data. And we can do this better now by using uh, visualization uh, and putting these data into sort of context that is relevant to us, uh, our daily questions that we have, that enable us to engage with this research and actually co uh, discovering it and also sometimes participating in the research by using this new technology as visualization, for example. Uh, Last slide. Uh, this is a challenge. Is it is our force that we work interdisciplinary. Also, I would say inter over generations. This is really a, a strength that we have as science museums and museums that we put uh, research uh, with, into context and that also we address different research at the same time simultaneously. We need to be able to do that in order to find new sustainable solutions. That is also a dilemma. Again, Lynn, I, I put, I'm sorry, I, I'm addressing you, but you stand for the, the, the politics. Uh, this is also a dilemma for us because it means that we, we force 
we fall between chairs when we try to get the air from the political system. Uh, we could be in the Ministry of Education, obviously, but also in the Ministry of Environment, the Ministry of Economy, and so forth. And therefore, we have a hard time finding who to talk to, who to get the ear from to actually give us a long-term assignment and using us as the true force that we really are. Thank you. Last but not least. Does it sound like it's on? Oh, yeah, there we go. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, we were given seven minutes to talk about our outlook on, on science engagement. And I think everyone knows that it can't be done in seven minutes. It needs a longer discussion, I think. Um, and I sort of have heard pretty much everything that I'll talk about from my two colleagues as well. But I anticipated um, them covering a lot of what I wanted to cover. So my, my presentation might be uh, slightly different, although I will be skipping my slide on science capital now. Thank you, Karina. I can save time there. Um, but basically, I'm going to try to take you through a what, uh, why, uh, what, who, and why of, of uh, science engagement. Um, okay, so what is it really that we're offering when we talk about science engagement from a, from a natural history museum and a, and a science center point of view? Well, I think we all would agree, the three of us at least, that we want to try to provide a, an immersive, a fun, and engaging experience for everyone that joins. And this concept of lifelong learning is particularly important, I think, at uh, science centers and, and natural history museums because we cater to um, people of all ages, from, from very young kids to um, seniors in society. So that becomes a really important thing. But what is it? What is embedded in an immersive, fun, and engaging experience? We can all say those words, and, and what do they mean? Well, I actually it will become quite dry here, and some of you, uh, at least from this institution, will recognize this slide and know it quite intimately. Um, I think we are offering information. Right? That is essentially what we're offering, but not any type of information. We're offering information that is guided by scientific effort, that is understood um, by the scientific community <clears throat> to be as close to the truth as possible. We heard the term truth this morning, and I'm not entirely sure that there is such a thing. But what we do in science is strive towards something that becomes universally accepted. And these are the principles that we use, uh, fair and care principles in, in science, but I think it applies equally to what we're trying to provide to the general audience. The fact that uh, information, data, if you will, if you want to make it even drier, but information that we provide is findable, it's accessible, interoperable, reusable. It has collective benefit. We have authority to control it through science and research. We have a responsibility and we need to um, adhere to ethical guidelines. I think these four or these eight principles um, actually are what we should be trying to, uh, to use not only in the scientific method, um, but also when we're trying to engage the public in science. We have a responsibility to bring them um, good information that is based on, uh, that has a scientific foundation. Uh, we've spoken about science capital. I'll, I'll click through these because I think these four um, points speak a lot to, uh, to what Karina already spoke about. Um, you can think of science capital as, as a bag that you fill up with everything that you know about science, your social connections, if your parents are scientists, everything that you know about science and the, and the way that you value science uh, in general. That fills up a, a bag of science capital. And, and we speak of social capital. I think most of you probably know what that is. And just apply science to that and think of it as the same thing. The, the more you know, the better, essentially. But I think uh, what we also need to discuss is the fact that science capital can be quite uh, ex exclusive, uh, elitist almost. Um, the richer get richer and the poorer get poorer to some extent. So I think we have a, a, a tremendous responsibility as science centers and natural history museums to make sure that science capital is for everyone, right? That it's accessible to everyone. And I think we are part of the last frontiers in order to carry out this, this mission. I think we, we provide hands-on experiences, although technology is something that we try to, to, to move forward with, but we're sort of the last frontier to provide that hands-on experience. Okay, so who has the knowledge then? Who has this information? The care and fair principles are great, but who, who, who sits on, on this type of information? 
Well, I would argue that schools, universities, science centers, research museums are part of the players that have this information through the researchers that, or the research activities that are ongoing there. But of course, just like Peter and just like Karina said, the outdoors has this information, right? Nature has this information. Lots of other places have this information, but it's sort of uh, created, the knowledge is created at schools, universities, science centers, and research museums, I would argue. But who has the mission then? Who has the mission to engage people and to bring this information to a general audience? Well, I think that, um, I'm not sure about the other institutions on stage here, but the Natural History Museum in Stockholm um, has it in our, in our instructions from the government through the, uh, the Ministry of Culture um, that we are to be relevant to people in society. And I think we have that mission to guide people through research in a fun, immersive, and engaging way. Um, I see that science centers have on par, uh, an, an equal responsibility here to bring these, this information to the, uh, to the general public. And I would argue that schools have it too. Universities sort of by definition um, do not have that, uh, that same outreach component or uh, historically they have not. But I'm very, very happy to say that the, the idea has shifted or the paradigm has shifted in, in recent years. And I think we've heard a lot about it this morning as well, how universities also have this mission to bring information uh, in, in a good way, to have scientific outreach uh, and engagement um, as, as part of their pillars uh, at, at the universities. Okay, so why is this important? Okay, so I'll run through this. Why is this important? Well, there are lots of reasons. I could give you lots of reasons why it's important. I chose this, which is a 2015 study by AAAS, and I realized that the US might in many ways be an outlier uh, in, in understanding science. So I'm not saying that, that this is perfect, and I'm saying it's a 2015 study, so it, it's quite old. Um, but there are certain things here that I think are, are really, really important. We've spoken about mis- and disinformation this morning. I think also lack of information uh, is very, very important, that we bring information to everyone uh, that is accessible to everyone pretty much across the globe as much as we can. This study showed that 79% of US adults say that science has made life easier. That's a good starting point. But what is um, sort of a bit worrying is if you look to the right here, um, you'll see that US adults think that scientists, 52% of US adults think that scientists are divided as to whether the Big Bang happened or not. Even more worrying, you can see that 37% of U.S. adults think that scientists do not agree that climate change is happening. 29% of U.S. adults think that scientists do not agree to the fact that humans have evolved over time. Right? We speak of mis- and disinformation, we speak of lack of information, and this is one of the, one of the, the, the reasons why, and there are several reasons why, but this is one of the reasons why we have such a strong responsibility uh, to bring um, information that's based on scientific knowledge and has a scientific foundation to a general audience. Uh, and I think that natural history museums and science centers have a critical role in that for the future. Thank you. Um, welcome back, uh, Karina and Peter as well. And thank you for your presentations. I would like to start with you, Peter. Uh, obviously, there were many similarities within the three presentations. Did you notice any, any differences at all? Any differences? I think when we bring science centers and so natural history museums together, they're always they're, uh, a difference. There's a difference in, in hands-on science and experiencing science and looking uh, at science through the lens of, uh, of the natural world. But what is striking to me is that we are concerned with the same questions. And what comes up again and again is the question of how do we lower the barriers? How do we invite people in? How do we open the doors? And it's not enough just to open the doors. And I think that's, to me, it's the key question. Take this museum, for example. You open the doors, but you still have to climb quite a few steps in order to get in. And that's a 
huge barrier. It's an imposing building. We have very imposing and intimidating institutions. Um, how do we make people feel welcome? How, would, how do we see that this is also this is also their world? And I think what we we're talking about is a bit. It's at the very centre of uh, of this. So it, the differences that I see is our different ways of trying to get rid of those barriers, of uh, finding out what does it mean to actually invite people in, because it's not enough to open doors. Uh, we really need to engage with our audiences and our communities in a completely different way compared to what we've done previously. And taking that further, you both mentioned the, the science capital uh, approach, and the approach is really about making science relevant for everyone. But in practice, Sebastian, how did you, is it possible? Is it possible to offer experiences without being excluding, but at the same time interesting enough for those uh, with knowledge and interest beforehand? Yeah, that's a great question. I think we struggle with that um, on a daily basis. And I, 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 you know, we'd be, uh, at least in, 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 at, at our institution, I'd be lying if I say that we didn't think about it on a daily basis and discuss it on a daily basis. Um, because we need to make we you know we need to make this uh, engaging experience um, accessible. Just like just like Peter was saying that our our institutions are um, intimidating, perhaps, uh, and we have challenges with accessibility, physical accessibility in the buildings, for example. Um, we think about these things in order to get um, people through the doors. Um, we think about the cost of going to natural history museums or science centers. Um, we think about how to mitigate those costs in a way that that uh, that leaves us uh, still sort of at, at a zero sum game, and uh, you know we think about really ways of getting a, a wide array of demographics into the museum, and there are certain tools that we use for that, and I think some are are still under testing, and some are good, and some uh, perhaps don't work as well for us. I think every every institution probably has its own set of or its own toolkit to to try to to uh, guide people into the museum uh, or or science center, and I think we would all benefit from sharing those toolkits with each other, um, because there are ideas out there that that we don't that we don't really know about. I think it is um, we run the risk of being of excluding people uh, when we think of science capital in this way, uh, but I think it's important enough to think about it, to, to think about our mission being building science capital for us to try to mitigate those risks. And um, socioeconomic uh, aspects apart, um, Karina, do you see any specific target groups that are especially hard to, to get here or even in, in outreach work uh, reach? Oh, another great question. <laughs> there are Unfortunately, several. Uh, but if I uh, to, gen to start generalizing, I would say us adults in general, because you know the the, the younger ones are, are seldom the problem. They are curious enough and don't have the sort of barriers to to step into the world of uh, of learning or STEM or uh, other other um, disciplines. Uh, and uh, in as adults, you know, I can see parents coming to us tend to be inactive. So that's, that's a barrier we need to address and we need to understand how to do it. Uh, but they do come because they do come with their, with, with their children. Another target group, um, again, I'm sorry, <laughs> Lena, is actually about decision makers in general and politicians. Because I, I would love for us to, to meet more often. Uh, to together think about these issues and uh, and also to understand that we throughout life and uh, need to learn more need to to be in dialogue about these these questions and politicians are by nature it's, it's more short term because there's a system in it but we are infrastructures that are here on a long term basis working over generations having that kind of view uh, and i we would all um, benefit uh, from uh, uh, a far more closer dialogue than we do have today and last thing yeah, also another target group is actually i might be actually researchers because i think that it's it's great that um, 
a science engagement is part of a sort of university's outreach strategy, but I'd love to see it being part of the research strategy. And there's a difference in this, I think. Uh, and I think when I talk to headmasters and trying to you know, be close to the researchers at the university, it's tough because they are not acknowledged when they do invest time and energy and money into that interconnection between with us. Uh, it's part of the outreach strategy, but it's never part of the research strategy. And I would love to see more of that. So that's also targeted to that we're actually pretty tough. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. And I would like to invite you all, uh, if you have any questions uh, already, not to wait too long for that. Um, do you have any? Yes, here's a question. Can you share an example of when you've left the building and done something engaging in a community or a neighborhood with an audience that's not the typical audience to walk through the doors? <laughs> Yeah, Peter, do you want to go? Yeah, I'd like to give you an example. We've uh, One of the things that we would like to do is not just to engage our local community, but also bring communities together. We would like people in Denmark to connect with people in Sweden, but also going beyond uh, the Western world, going and f to see how we can establish a global, co a global conversation. We ran an experiment uh, Late uh, last year, beginning of uh, of this year, where we set up portals of communication in 25 different places around the world. So most of them in uh, in on the African continent and in Asia and South uh, America. These were portals for communication. You could we could fit in five, eight, ten people uh, that would communicate via a video link uh, to communities, to groups around the world about. Uh, climate change, about uh, our relationship to, to nature. This opened up for conversations that would never have happened and they were full of surprises and they were incredibly rewarding, especially for our audience. Uh, and it was such an eye-opening thing of the commitment, the engagement and the knowledge of communities in, for instance, Tanzania. Um, this is what, what we can do uh, as museums and we ran this as, as a pilot. How can we start building the logistics for having a genuine global platform for communicating to establish that global communication that we need where we are connecting communities and not just talking to our local communities but really bring people together so that's one example we have time for one more uh, answer to that. Yeah. Okay, another example is very local then. In, in, in Gothenburg, we, together with the um, business community and also the public sort of, what do you call it, facility management, we've gone together out into areas, neighborhoods, uh, where you have a multicultural sort of inhabitants, 43 different langu languages within a sort of an area of a few kilometers. And we go out and where they li actually, we, we found together, we found an area where we could stay inside with the roof of our head and we meet with, you know, um, parents uh, from all over the world and they never met themselves even though they are neighbors. So we go there on a regular basis and we bring science with us because that's sort of something to do together. Uh, and a lot of things happens there. It's the first time they, they actively engage with each other. They actively engage with different parties from the society. And uh, we actually now also help with we go with them, we take the bus together and go into the center of the city where the, many of them never have been. So that's also another way of working where you meet uh, audiences that would never step inside these intimidated buildings, for example. So. Thank you. We have a comment from Menti as well, I think. Uh, Katarina. Uh, That's another question. Yeah, I, I think we... Yeah, you need a mic. Yeah. Uh, so here's a question from Menti. Uh, we hear a lot about schools. How can we increase the science capital of adults? Sebastian, would you like yeah, to answer? Yeah, great. Yeah, really good question. I think Karina um, mentioned this before that it's a real, uh, you know, that adults is is a, uh, a challenging demographic. 
I think actually that you hit on three demographics that wouldn't be traditionally thought of as, as challenging to get into a museum. And I think you're absolutely right. I agree with that. Um, you know, adults uh, and researchers, I think, are, are underrepresented at the museum. We all speak about Generation Z, where, uh, you know, everything happens on your phone instead of in, in real life. And, and how do we get those, uh, those uh, youngsters now uh, through the doors? How do we get adults? Uh, how do we increase science capital with adults? Well, it's, it's a lot more difficult, I'd say, uh, just from a human psychology point of view, the longer that you're sort of ingrained in your, in your view of the world, uh, the, the stronger it becomes in you. Um, I don't have a, a recipe for, for how to engage adults that, that differs a lot from how we engage uh, you know, other demographics. Um, but I think there, you know, when you think of, I mean, one thing that we do here at the Natural History Museum, I think, is that we, um, and quite naturally, we get families in, right? And I think if we engage the children, the adults will be engaged as well. I've heard a story, I forget who tol told me the story, but um, there was a, a, a Natural History Museum, um, actually correct me, I think it, it, may, it may have been in, in Helsinki, that was um, set to be shut down. And the, the, the staff there invited the children of the local politicians to the place to, to enjoy the, the um, surroundings. And obviously that led to the politicians saying, you know what, um, we're gonna keep this place because our children love it so much. <laughs> and so they funded a, a place, an institution that was set to be, to be uh, shut down um, because they saw the inspiration and the, and the joy that the children had. Maybe that's a recipe um, for that. I'm not sure. I think uh, it, it's challenging, but I think we, you know, we have a res responsibility to, to sort of engage society at, as a whole, um, and we need to make engaging experiences also for adults, and I'm not entirely sure. Um, well, I don't have a, a strict recipe, sorry. I'm, if you did, you'd be... No? Yeah, I, I'd be, yeah, maybe. I don't know rich, but I would be happy at least. Yeah. I think we have uh, one brief question here. Thank you. Thank you for, for this very interesting and valuable conference. And I would just like to come back to your statement or um, that you need to uh, reach the scientists. And I think I was um, listening yesterday, also attending the conference. And one important thing, where it was more on the policy and on the scientific side. And one important thing that was mentioned several times, I believe, is that we need to change the culture. There is a cultural change. And there need to be, and it, then it was about how to, to get away from these high impact factors and how to get away from prestigious journals and how to get new incentives for the scientists. And I think it's very important what you said that for scientists, to be able to, to spend time and, and to, to get insight into the value, there should be incentives that if they are only continue to be measured by this high impact, there will be no way to, to build that into their careers. So it, it relates quite a, a lot to what was said yesterday, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I, you um, talk a little about what you need? in order to continue your work with science engagement and science communication. Yes. And uh, I would like to ask some, some more about that. Could you elaborate a bit in practice? What do you need? Oh, but please, <laughs> Lynn. <laughs> um, well, I'll get back to, to, the, to the fact, and I'm, I'm repeating myself, I, I hear that now, that, but it's actually the, the fact that I found so challenging in the everyday work that we do that we, we don't fit into a model. And I think we hear that everyone asks for uh, actors, uh, organizations that actually, that ac uh, in, Truth, truthfully uh, look at different perspectives, truth, truthfully are interdisciplinary. And I, I, I truly think we are, we do work like that way and we, 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 you know, we, we really try really hard to do that. But the, again, the, the system doesn't support that. 
And that makes it the, t the work really hard. It makes it really, really hard because we need to sort of, I'm not asking for millions and billions of money. Uh, some money is good, it will help us. But it's also the fact that you, just, that you can address your question somewhere and be listened to. And uh, that there is a long-term sustainable political societal structure that supports that interdisciplinarity. That is, you know, I, I'm not the person to, to solve that, but I'm looking at you again, Len. I'm, uh, I, I think you are one of these persons who, who could help us, and, and, and I, that, that's really something that is needed. So difficult to move forward when, when there are fractions of questions all the time, when we, really, we all understand that we need to, to have a holistic view and to work uh, interdisciplinary to, to, to find these sustainable solutions, to actually contribute to a sustainable future together. Thank yeah. you. And let's take that to, to uh, a conference on, of its own, I think. Yes. It's big enough. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, and we can continue uh, the conversation afterwards. Uh, we're going to arrange for the next uh, panel now. And uh, now is a good time to stretch your legs. We'll be back soon. Thank you.
You have spent your uh, career in the public sphere in France, but I know that you are convinced European. And you have worked within two areas in particular, that of health and social affairs, but also culture. And as a synthesis of those two fields, you could say you are now CEO of Universions in Paris, uh, one of the largest hubs of uh, scientific and technical culture in Paris. And you're also president of EXCITE, the European Network for Science Centers and Museum. Bienvenue à Stockholm. Thank you, in French. And welcome C.C. Askvall, your Secretary General of Public and Science. But you know, moving on to new adventures um, at the Swedish Research Council. Sure. And you're also president of the European Science Engagement Association. And at the farewell party for you, last week, um, several speakers addressed your sharp communication skills, your ability to bring people together, to work together uh, with great results. So in other words, um, you are both perfect for this next panel discussion. Because now we're going to address how museums, science centers and science communication organizations work together on a European level. Uh, to create engagement. And we have invited you to make a short introduction, both of you, from your uh, perspective. And I would like to ask you, Bruno, to start, if you please. Okay. Duk, duk. That's it. Um, Hello everyone and thank you for your kind invitation, dear CC and dear Lisa. So I'm the president of um, Universions, um, as you said, with its two venues, public venues in Paris, France. Um, the first one is, well, the second one. <laughs> Palais de la Découverte, but it's the oldest one because we opened in 1937, but it's now closed for renovation and we have a small temporary facility, 100% wood, eco um, conception. And the other one is Cité des Sciences et de l'Industrie, which is the largest one in, uh, in a big park in the northeast of Paris. Both are science centers, which means museums without collections. But today, as you said, I come as president of Excite, the European Network of Science Centers and Museums. Some of you might know Excite, some of my, of my colleagues are members of Excite. We have 16 members in Sweden. Um, and let me just remind you in a few words what Excite is and more importantly, what it does. Excite brings together various institutions Oh my gosh, what is, what is this screen? I lost my, okay. Excite brings together various institutions, organizations that engage with science. In other words, their goal is to build a bridge between science and society to engage citizens and scientists in dialogue. It is a very large family because we are more than 320 members, 328 to be precise, including natural history museums, of course, science centers, science museums, festivals, research bodies, private companies, and so on. All committed to inspiring people with science, technology, innovation, human ingenuity. You'll find us all across Europe, from Portugal to Poland, from Greece to Sweden, also in Ukraine, which we do not forget. Altogether, we reach 40 million citizens each year with exhibitions, workshops, science-related events, debates, and so on. Most, most of our audiences are on-site visitors, but we try more and more to reach them digitally, uh, hence broadening our audience to people who think that science is not for them. But it's, this is exactly our goal, making science accessible, and understandable, and palatable to everyone, regardless of age, gender, or level of knowledge. Our ambition lies in addressing the youngest to the oldest, in addressing schools and families, both the curious and the experts, and in addressing policy makers to ministers especially, finding ways to attract and to attach them to our museums. What we want 
is to allow them to understand the crucial issues of our time from a scientific perspective. For, and this is our deepest conviction, science is and will be the culture of the 21st century. But don't get me wrong, we do not tell our audiences what they should do or think. We provide them with access to science through discovery and experimentation in order to let them think and decide by and for themselves. In other words, we, what we do is empower our visitors, help them find their way in this world, sort out the true from the false. This is, in my view, key to living in a world that changes so quickly, a world that is and will be deeply marked by climate emergency. It is our duty uh, to explain what climate change is, how the greenhouse effects works, etc., etc., but more importantly, it is our duty to explain how to tackle the task we need to carry out, to tell them why and how we can develop low carbon habits and ways of living, how to build a more sustainable world. Science engagement organizations can be the leading edge on this task. This is why Excite has announced the launch of the Excite Environmental Emergency Pledge, um, as well as a program of activities for its members. The pledge is a statement of intent designed to mobilize and communicate actions towards environmental responsibility. It aims to encourage our members to take small or big steps in the right direction in order to drive, to drive change. So as you see on the screen, through this pledge, our ambition is to lead by example in raising our own standards and practices in what we called the five P's programs, which means all activities, events and exhibitions, partnerships, with whom are we working, people, everyone who works with us, volunteers or contributes to our operation, publics, of course the visitors, and places, our physical infrastructures and spaces, which are so big. Um, we know the task will not be easy, will not be achieved in one day, and will even challenge our business models, but it is our responsibility as any other institution emitting CO2 and at the same time our most critical concern as cultural players specialized in science. Beyond that, empowering our fellow citizens is a way to embolden them to engage and participate in science. We need to show them they can... One more minute. <laughs> <laughs> it's cooked. Uh, we need to show them they have a valuable role in addressing the global challenges facing humankind. Um, for citizens should be considered as actors of innovation, not just as an audience one should inform or a market one should enter. Most citizens are willing to take part in this global change. According to Eurobarometer survey, September 2021, 61% of Europeans think that involving non-scientists in research ensures that science responds to the needs of the society. So we work and bridge the gap between science and society by linking researchers, educators, policymakers, NGOs, business, industries to the general public. Most of all, I think, I want to stress the fact that we know how to design fruitful relationship with it. We are social designers, to put it in a nutshell, or chefs trying new recipes to help water and oil mix together in a stable way. We are committed to develop evidence-based practices of science engagements as well as science engagements, science. Um, I will give example after, um, during this uh, question session. I think we can do more. There is room for improvements. If we want more citizens to engage with science, we need to join forces, you see, with other networks, with other cultural institutions, and of course with research institutions. Last, the minister is not here yet, but we need more resources allocated to science, but not only to science, to science communication at large, because we are the people, we are the people of Europe. Uh, so kind of a message in a bottle. Uh, don't be afraid, I won't sing. Eurovision contest is over and most of all, you won it. Thank you for your attention.
thank you, Bruno. Uh, we have a lot more to discuss here, but uh, first, welcome, Sissi, for your short presentation. Yes, thank you so much. So nice being here and actually also being one of the organizing uh, uh, arrangers of this conference. Um, so I'm here as the president of UC, but as you heard, I'm also um, the secretary general for Vetenskap och Almenhet, at least for two more days. Um, so there are quite a few similarities between uh, UC and Excite and also between uh, UC and Vetenskap och Almenhet. So um, you see, it's a European network, this is Excite. We are your smaller sister, little sister, you could say. We have 126 members, but counting. Um, and in Sweden, Vetenskap och Almenhet has 106 institutional members. So you see, uh, attracts, uh, coordinates a network of science communicators, public engagers, so practitioners of different kinds, working at museums, science centers, but also in organizations like Vetenskap och Almenhet, organizing science events of, of different kinds. Uh, and as you can see, just as Excite, we uh, have this large annual conference when the community is gathering. Uh, we just had that in uh, beautiful Bolzano two weeks ago. Um, we also try to gather different tools, formats, good reads for doing science uh, engagement and science communication. So we have this, what we call the science engagement platform. And we also try to meet between the conferences, online gatherings of different kinds to exchange experience and, and to develop our competencies. Um, we try to, uh, when possible, collaborate with other networks, for instance, lobbying in Brussels, and also to to care for one another, to try to get this community going, to have exchange the informal meetings of different kinds. So that's what UC is doing. And you said there are 16 Excite members. I'm sorry to tell you that so far it's only two Swedish members of UC. So this is an open invitation. So check out UC. It might be something for you. It's not very uh, expensive. It's more expensive to become an Excite member. <laughs> well, uh, we've been talking about open science during these two days. Um, we really use it both at Wetenskap and Almenhet and you see uh, this concept of open science is quite useful when it comes to talking about the importance of science communication and public engagement. So as you heard, and we addressed it uh, thoroughly yesterday, Many think of, of open science as open access, uh, open data, uh, scholarly publications should be open and free to access. But I think it's useful to use open science as a concept also to, to show uh, that it's about communicating, it's about engaging, involving uh, different stakeholders and the public at large into research and innovation processes because you know, politicians uh, have already decided, we have this uh, common understanding that open science, this is the way to go. So using uh, open science, we know that, sorry, uh, that <laughs> we all uh, are uh, agreed, have agreed on that open science is the way forward. And if you find out then that a part of that would be uh, public engagement, science communication, citizen science. So it makes it so much easier. And also, um, we've you've seen this um, this figure, this illustration, several times already during the two conference days. But I think it's quite useful, showing clearly that the ones, the green ones, which we addressed uh, yesterday, and also the the purple one. Uh, are important parts, of course, of open science, but also the, the orange uh, one, and also what was briefly discussed in the previous session before for lunch, that you should also be open to other knowledge system. It could be indigenous people, for instance, there are other types of knowledge that you also should take into account. And it's quite 
interesting that this UNESCO recommendations were actually adopted by uh, all 193 UNESCO member states. So it's really useful, I think, with this recommendation. And you also seen this before. Uh, several have, have already uh, talked about um, science capital and now I've filled the bags we saw before uh, that uh, you already know, but it's, it's not only about what you know about science, but also about your attitudes, uh, how much you, you do science-related activities for different kinds, like going to a science center or watch science TV, for instance. And also, and not at least important, the people that you actually relate to and their attitudes and their knowledge to science and, and research. So this is also a very useful concept, I think, and a lot of politicians, policymakers feel that it's really important you think about future competence and you need to, to make sure that we have those highly skilled people going into higher education. So we need to build that science capital because that makes a difference. A lot more people who do have uh, this science capital would be interested in embarking on uh, higher education and eventually maybe a research career. So how do you do public engagement, science engagement? I think it's important always to think of what's the purpose? What do you want to achieve? Why, why would you do an activity? And then depending on the activity, what kind of people do you need them to, to address and get in touch with and engage in this? And of course, you, you pick accordingly then the right process with a suitable process to do that. Uh, so maybe your purpose would be just to, people should know a little bit more about science maybe, or know about you and what you're doing, raise awareness. Or maybe you would like also to consult to get some views, some input on what you're doing. Um, uh, maybe discuss, you know, ethical uh, uh, questions related to research, for instance. But you could also be that you really want to engage and get people to co-create together with you. Um, through the research and innovation process, it might be very useful to also engage stakeholders or people affected in different ways to get the results as use, useful and, and um, sustainable as, as possible. So depending on the purpose, you have to pick people accordingly and then also, of course, choose the right method, the right format, the concepts uh, of what kind of, of engagement process you want to, to go through. And this is just to show you that we compiled quite a few different formats and also some, some good reads in this, uh, what I said before, the European Science Engagement Platform, which can be found then on the UC website. So this was very briefly what I wanted to tell you about. Thank you, Sissi. <laughs> and welcome back, Bruno. Welcome. So, thank you both. As a starting point, I would like to uh, address you, Bruno. Ladies first, no? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not this time. Um, I would like to give you three, three questions in one, so to say, to reason around. From your European outlook, how, how big is our challenge? How are we doing with science engagement? Um, I will... Uh, begin with the good news is that visitors came in numbers after the pandemics and they are back in our science centers and museum. I, I don't know if you do agree with me, dear colleagues, but everywhere in Europe, in every country, there's a big wave of visitors coming back to, to our museum. Of course, it's because they, w they were fed up with uh, their screens and being at home, but not only, you know, they they are interested in science, as many um, surveys can show, and so we, uh, I think we provide them with that, what they need now. So that's the challenge is to, uh, to be uh, attractive enough in the long, long term. And so that's people 
who are now in our museum come and come back more, more and more. That's really good to hear. Yeah, sometimes. Uh, there are good news. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Sissi, from your European experience, um, how easy, easy is it to share and duplicate best practice? I'm thinking, uh, is there a need to adjust due to different systems, uh, for example, within the public administration, education, funding and so on? I think, I mean, the basic ideas or concepts uh, could be reused. Of course, you need to to make some adjustments and, and cater to the local context, depending on what kind of people you would like to reach out to and what kind of, of local circumstances there are. And also, of course, the, the actual arenas or venues that you're using. So, of course, you need to adapt. But I think there's a, a lot of good ideas, good formats. And that's why we meet at those large uh, international conferences to really exchange uh, ideas and to get inspiration or steal with pride, if you like. Yeah, very good. And um, several organizations have embraced the inclusion of the A in STEM, making STEAM. And um, this is, of course, to include a broader audience. Um, and again, from your European outlook, do, do you see science and, and culture also being competitors in some way? Or is science and scientific culture a natural part of culture as a whole, do you think, Bruno? Uh, I don't think there is more competition with art museums than with other museums. There's no competition. The more museums you have, the more visitors you have. It's not a cake that you have to cut into pieces and with a limited number of people accessing it. So um, what we have witnessed is that um, art has been used in science museum for ages, for decades. Um, especially not only to broaden audiences, but uh, as well to uh, help show or explain what is not yet discovered, which is unknown. So artists are very, uh, um, let's say, uh, are keen on uh, working on something that does not exist yet. And that's the difference between research, research and science. Science, we know what it is, research, questions not results so how the artists can help us to uh, to talk about questions which of course is uh, something that does not exist yet and we have more and more i think to uh, focus on research as well as focus on science and on the other side on the opposite art museums are more and more interested in science uh, you have everywhere um, exhibitions on let's say planet subject or biodiversity I visited uh, a flower exhibition in Munich um, 10 days ago at the Kunsthalle which is a real art place but we are interested in um, new subjects because of course artists are interested in our world so artists are talking about climate change are talking about uh, the new form of life, of communications, and as a result, the art museum are interested in it too. Yeah, I think like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think there's a quite quite a large number of good examples where where science and art really can work together. Of course, there are, are challenges, but but also artists and different cultural express, expressions can help us to to grasp uh, the idea of of science and vice versa, that people normally may be more interested in, in cultural expressions uh, compared to, to science, this could, those collaborations can open up to new audiences. And I know, um, looking at you, Anna Maria, we, the science galleries, which are in, in um, unfortunately, the very first science gallery in Dublin closed down, but they, they, they will reopen. Re they will reopen. Yes. Oh, that's good. We get good news. Uh, go, another yes. good news. But there are, yeah. there are quite a few. So the idea of those science galleries is, is exactly to, to mix those two together. I think it's really interesting concepts. I think both Arts and cult art and, and science really can can um, win a lot of collaborating. Definitely. 
And we do have an art institution uh, at uh, Stockholm University as well. Uh, yes, um, it's true. Accelerator. Yes. yes, yes. And uh, talking about engagement, I was so happy to see so many hands before uh, in the audience. So uh, I don't want to wait too long to, to let you in uh, to the discussion and, and the possibility to ask questions again. So um, do we have any questions in the room to start with? Otherwise, I'm sure we have at Menti. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Please, Peter. Well, this would be a, a comment, but also perhaps an, an opener for, for discussion. And I'd like to return to the question of resources that uh, was addressed uh, uh, in, in, in your presentation uh, and was also addressed in the, uh, in the previous session. We have a field station in Tanzania and we built a visitor center just next door, very rural parts of Tanzania uh, in the Otsungu Mountains. And I am amazed to see what they can do with almost nothing. And I think our discussion about resources should have a different starting point. It should not be us going out and saying, well, if you want us to deliver some, uh, something to achieve all of this, you, we, we need more resources. And on, before we, we get more resources, we can't really deliver our, the next big thing. I think we need to think smarter about the resources, about what we already have. And I think the key is exactly in what you were talking about here, about art and science, but we need to broaden that. Uh, we need to think about ourselves as a, one big ecosystem of resources. And we need, and I think our, our biggest resource is each other. And there's, an, as I see it, a largely overlooked potential in what we can do together. We don't have to do, we don't have to, each and every one of our institutions of, to solve everything in terms of inter or transdisciplinarity, if we are connecting all of our uh, institutions in this ecosystem, if we're bringing in schools, universities, NGOs, uh, political organizations, industry, and see, and see this and start working together, I think that would be a, a smart use of the resources that we already have. And we have quite a lot. We're exceptionally privileged in, the, in Europe. And I think we can do a lot more with what we already have. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Um, do you agree? Or yes. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> Quick answer. <laughs> yeah. And Bruno as well. Yeah. There's uh, enough to work with to start with. Yeah. And um, uh, what can we do more? Oh, we have a question. Please go ahead. Um, Bruno uh, presented at the beginning the um, science centers as um, um, science museums without collections, and I and I se sensed a, a bit of re resentment in that uh, sense. But I think that that's actually the benefit of, of science centers that they are flexible. And uh, my name is Michalis Tsetsanis. I'm a national contact point in Austria for um, Horizon Europe, and. I'm trying to persuade researchers when they're uh, putting in proposals that they have to take uh, dissemination and communication of the results seriously. And of course, science museums and science uh, centers usually um, uh, um, deal with, um, um, how to put it, uh, not basic research, but, but the laws of nature, the laws of, of science and so on uh, in general. So you experience, I don't know what, um, um, gravity and you experience evolution and you experience some, so, so, such things. But there is a need to, um, um, to use science centers and, and museums to communicate actual contemporary research results, so to say, things coming out of, for example, Horizon Europe programs and uh, projects. And, and I see the benefit there for, for science centers that they are, without having their collections, a bit flexible to take up these things. How do you see the role of science centers or even the previous panelists, science museums, um, in providing, so to say, a venue for uh, communicating latest uh, uh, science results and research results? Bruno, would you like to start? Yeah, I'll start saying that I don't like the word communication because we do not communicate. Um, it goes far beyond that. 
Um, it's not a question of a message from A to B. You are the emitter, I'm the receiver. It's much more than that. That's why we prefer the word engagement with science, which of course involves different formats and that is far away from being passive, a passive receiver for something that is given by someone that knows and that gives something to me that I don't know. That's, uh, I think, the new, the new world in which we are entering is a very different one where the knowledge is everywhere. You don't have to communicate. Everything is here. So you can have the national libraries, uh, all the knowledge of the world in your pockets. So the question is not to communicate because uh, we are, you know, overwhelmed by information, but how do we um, uh, help our visitors or our non-visitors, the audiences, the general public, to, to know how to swim in the new ocean of knowledge? How do we react in such a new situation? It is really different from the world which uh, we knew uh, before, where knowledge was in books, books were in libraries, and so it was simple, and we needed teachers. Uh, now you we have visitors that know a lot more than we know. So the question is how to help them, to train them to uh, uh, have sound reasoning, how to sort information, what is, what is false, what is right, and more, um, as science is concerned, how do we know what we know? This is a question today. How do I know that Earth is a round shaped? It's the first thing saying it's round. The second is how do we know that? And that's, I think, our new duty as science centers and museum for me. We are, we, we are doing the same business. Uh, how do we help people to, to be um, citizens in this new information world? I think also we had uh, quite a good examples from from Karina at the Universium about all the different roles this large science center takes on. It's not only about science and engage uh, young people or, or the public at large with science, but it's also to reach out to different communities to be an important part of the, the community. So I think really science centers, and I, I do uh, understand that it's, it's complicated because of, in this more uh, squared world where you have so your museums, your schools, so science centers in somewhere in between. And I know there are some, some issues with, with funding uh, in Sweden for, for science centers, generally speaking, um, but it's really uh, they have different roles and really important uh, players locally. And, and one role can, can be um, to act as an arena platform for many different opinions, even fact-based, you can have different opinions. Um, how challenging is that you know, for, for a museum and an, or a science centre to open up and being the uh, sort of uh, monitoring in a good way um, a discussion uh, that can move forward without excluding and without having an opinion of their own. Do we have enough knowledge in-house to do that, do you think, at our institutions? Well, that's our job, basically. That's why we are four. Um, and that's why we open our gates in the morning and close them at night. It's because we know, well, we try to do it so, and we are, uh, we try, it works, we are happy, it doesn't work, we, we try something else, and so we are very humble. Uh, humility, of course, is very, very important, but I think we have to work with everyone, but we have to be as close as possible, but as distant as, as possible of um, interferences, you know, because uh, there are interests in society, which is a good thing, but we are, uh, we are um, serving the public interest, so we are not serving the interest of any um, particular segment of society, which is very important. So we are different from governments, we are different from um, science centers, we are different from media, we are different from schools. Uh, where we work with them, but knowing that we are different and we keep um, 
our freedom of uh, action, which is the most valuable asset that we have, being free to do what we, what we do as museums. But I think um, museums, science centers, but also like libraries, different uh, cultural institutions, community centers, uh, are great places for, for having those discussions. As, as you say, not all scientists think alike, and there are, of course, many controversial issues to be discussed with new technology, speaking about AI, not the least uh, these days. And of course, it's important then to cater for having that kind of open discussions. And of course, it's a, um, there's a thin line between if there's really pseudoscience, there's really, you know, uh, conspirational theories coming up. So how should you act uh, as a moderator, for instance? But I think it's really great to open up and having those discussions, because there are not so many forums, of course, there are media, but where people also actively can, can take part and also be part of a conversation. Uh, and I think much more of that uh, are needed, not only open up and, and uh, let people engage with science as such, but also to have this public discussion about scientific uh, developments. But we are cu curators. We curate the relationship between the public and science. We, that's what our job is. We are curators. It's not just bringing people in a room and, you know, something happens. It's not as simple as that. We design um, delicate ways of um, interaction between subjects and people. And of course, everyone does it um, in its own way, uh, because um, I know many science centers and museums, and uh, they are all different in, in, in the way that they, one will work um, with the university, the other one will work with the industry, another one with, uh, with a school or with NGO. But locally, it's always a different story, but there are, let's say, uh, rooted to their environments, they, they build ecosystem. We are ecosystemic uh, by by nature, and also always the local, the national, and the global perspective in a yeah. whole. Yeah, I think we have a comment from Mente, Katarina. Hello. Yes. <laughs> so here's the question: uh, Open science and open arts, two different worlds. Question mark. Uh, if art is essential for citizens, it should be more financed and more open and accessible as science. Your views? Mm, interesting question. Yeah. So, uh, well, of course, I mean, uh, artists, they have their, their copyright. They can choose for themselves, of course, to, to uh, let everyone uh, look at, interact, maybe even uh, with a Creative Commons license to, to interfere and interact with, with that piece of art, and that's what's quite common. Um, when it comes to, to science and open science, I think we all agree on, on the, the, the importance of openness and that science is really building on, it's, it's uh, like a, a mountain of knowledge where we, we build on each, each other's findings. Uh, for art, it could be that way. It could also be very you know, unique uh, coming from your own experiences. So I think it's more of, uh, this is what I think of instantly. So you please say what you think, but you can choose if you like others to to interact and to to use and to to republish and reuse what you have achieved no. final think, comment nothing to add <laughs> nothing okay. to add it was all clear you used to be a, a director of an art museum yeah yeah right centre pompidou you still agree yeah Yes, I do. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, we could continue much, much longer, but we uh, are going to continue to um, the final uh, speech here. Um, so I thank you so much for your participation. Thank you.
So we're a tiny bit ahead of schedule, so if you just want to stand up and do like this for one minute, and then <laughs> I introduce the next exciting speaker. Did you feel how the blood <laughs> continued running through your body again? Felt a bit stiff. So please have a seat and we continue the program. So there are some empty spaces in the, in the center here if there is filling up in, uh, along the, the sides. All right, exciting. So I'm, I'm proud, grateful, and uh, actually quite curious <laughs> to be able to invite the next speaker of the day. And it's our uh, Minister for Culture here in Sweden, it's Parisa Lidia Strand. And um, you will have the floor now and you'll talk about the way forward. So please, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, and thank you for having me, I have to say. I was very honored to get the question. Thank you. Well, uh, I have to say that I was uh, really honored to be here and to get the question to be able to address you in a really, really important conference in an important matter. So I hope that you have had two really fruitful days here in Stockholm and uh, that I, I can contribute with a little bit of perspective. Research must be made accessible both within the scientific community and in the rest of society. Open science is therefore a highly prioritized matter for the Swedish government. This conference is a good example of the, how different actors can come together in cooperation that benefits the whole society. The National Library in Sweden and the Swedish Research Council have been given the task uh, from the government to coordinate the work being done on open access publications and on open research data. Universities and institutions of higher learning are also tasked with developing the work being done on open science. Many institutions within the cultural heritage sector, such as this wonderful museum, that I hope you have had a chance to see a bit of, are involved in research and closely as associated with universities and other research institutions. Cultural heritage institutions have a long tradition of publishing online for the benefit of researchers as well as for the public. We know how important it is that research-based knowledge is spread and is being used in society. This is something that we must care for in order to understand and to be able to handle the big challenges that are facing us and that are ahead of us now and for coming generations. Therefore, another important task is in the Swedish Research Council's work on science communication, including its intention to develop a platform for science and research results. Science communication, the active involvement of researchers and scientists in the public conversation, is an important part of making research-based knowledge more accessible in society and thus contribute to spreading up the transition to a more sustainable society. This is a responsibility of other government agencies and institutions of higher learning and research as well. The goal is to create good conditions for making new research accessible throughout society and to promote dialogue between researchers and the public. 
Several important tasks are already being done to the end of making science and research more accessible to all parts of society. Increasing mankind's understanding of scientific process and making peop people comfortable and trusting in science. This is positive and hugely important. Making the public engaged and part of the scientific process lead to different kinds of interaction between researchers and society. There are plenty, plenty of good examples of that and the positive effects on such interactions. And I have to say that this uh, discussions that you have had during these two days are one of the good examples of this. The impact of research is strengthened when the scientific process is opened up and scientific results are made accessible. By making more groups in society part of the scientific process, we can also strengthen the public's knowledge and understanding of these processes. This has many benefits. By strengthening the trust in science and higher education in all of society, we can increase the resilience against disinformation and knowledge resistance. Thank you for listening and thank you for inviting me and having me here today. Thank you very much. And we have a little gift from the museum. Thank <laughs> yeah. you. Okay, so the last bit of today is to summarize these two days and how to do that. It's a big task and I'm so happy that I'm not going to do it alone. So the host of yesterday's program, Karin Grönvall, our national librarian here in Sweden, please welcome up Thank you. Uh, to the stage. And we have this uh, joint task now to summarize these two days. Oh. And I, I was looking into the aims of this yeah. conference. And um, so what we, we said from the start was that uh, the aim of the Open Science from Policy to Practice conference was to highlight different perspectives of shaping, implementing and embedding Open Science as well as exchange knowledge, share best practice, and to discuss how open science can contribute to sustainable future and democracy. Yeah, it's a great plan. Yeah, it is. <laughs> In and beyond plan. European yeah. Union. Yeah. So it's, it's really something that we are devoted to and wanted to contribute to. And those were the aims. So how do you feel, Karin? Do yeah, you really well, like to the this? aims, we have to look at the aims in a, in a longer perspective, I suppose. Yeah, sure. uh, but I say so far what we, you can expect from a conference, I think we've really been discussing a broad uh, variety of issues. We've been discussing a sort of policy, how can you implement the policy, uh, and we have had great discussions. So in that sense, yes, and then you have to take it back home and see how can you actually act from these new perspectives you have gained. So yes, I would say uh, yes. We have also uh, stated, I think, that policy, yes, policy is policy, and then the researchers have to do the research <laughs> in open way. Uh, but our sort of perspective is really to make it possible, uh, and policy can enable open science. That's something I, I remember from from the discussions. So, so yeah, well. So what's your view from day two? Yeah, so I, I would say just in general over the two days that yeah. I think something that we really achieved was to have a fantastic turn up. Yeah. So it's both been uh, on site but uh, online as well. So uh, I heard that yesterday at some point we had close to 800 viewers digitally and it was also uh, maybe 100 or, or more both today and, and yesterday in the room. So I think that the interest is, um, is impressive and uh, and I think what made this conference a bit special was that we ha had colleagues crossing borders. Mm. 
Uh, I never met so many librarians, I think, <laughs> <laughs> at the conference before. You never met um, so Even though the, the bulk was... <laughs> I have. Academia. You have, I'm sure you have, but have you met as many museum representatives <laughs> as you have? Not on in that English international uh, perspective. No, that's true. Exactly. No, that's so true. So so in that sense, yeah. we have come together, yeah. I think, yeah. over these two days. And hopefully yeah. it's been, uh, as our um, Minister for Culture mentioned, it's been fruitful discussions. And I, yeah. I think and things uh, are... I think putting to the uh, the soil as new uh, perspectives meet. Yeah, but uh, and also politicians, researchers, policy makers. Uh, there's really okay. been a wide variety of uh, perspectives in Business, this conference. Industry, yeah, 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 NGOs. Yeah, yeah. And that's, right. that's been 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 very fruitful, I think. And I'm also very glad that we had uh, the state secretary for the Ministry of Education and Research opened the conference and she was very clear this is a priority, top priority for the Swedish uh, presidency uh, with open science. And I'm very glad <laughs> that the Minister of Culture, Parisa Lillestrand, uh, also said the same thing, agreed on that. So that's mm -hmm. give us sort of a very, very, very good starting point and a very good uh, bottom yeah. to keep working on this area. It's a really good in in mm. incentive for us to, to focus uh, and join. So I just need to have a look here. Go so it's second. just our names. We, we were discussing we should have a Menti question, but maybe we do have one. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> so I if you're ready with your, your, your phones and you have logged into the Menti with the code shown here on the, uh, your right hand side, uh, you can answer a question. And do we have the question here as well? What are your takeaways from the conference? Yes, yeah, so please do that while me and Cara will continue chit chatting. Yeah, a we bit chat more. more. <laughs> we might wait for, for the results there. And, and we maybe we should please. move backwards to, to the first day again at the National yes, Library. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And our starting point there was, of course, the, the, the assignment we have from the government to. to to make new sort of policy for open science and national guidelines. Uh, so, but I, I can think of three themes that I sort of noticed the first day, and the first one was really costs. I thought. I think costs got into everything. Uh, the discussion is open science more expensive or is it just a sort of tran transition period that is more expensive, but Every area we discussed uh, publication that that is expensive now, uh, and also building capacity and building uh, infrastructure is really expensive. Mm. So that was something that really got, went through or everything we talked about, and also it uh, in the council conclusions that we all look forward to. <laughs> they probably will be decided on next week. Cost is the main issue, so that is very important. The other theme is connected to that, I would say, is the global perspective, because we, we now in the Euro European perspective, we can we get it closer, we have more sort of common policy making, but we, we can't forget the global perspective. Uh, and the UNESCO guidelines are very clear in that area. And then costs again, is very an important issue not to leave some of the research outside because we need the global perspective to solve our, our very big uh, challenges we have in the society. And the third one that we didn't really discuss so much, but I think it was sort of it was there <laughs> all the time. It was really security with a new situation in Europe, and we're talking a lot about openness. Are there any new perspective we have to take in? Can everything be open? I think a lot. It's very important to keep very open, but maybe we have to rethink a little bit. We also have to make sure that, that access to information is possible in a crisis. I think that, that's something we have to consider. So I think, yeah, those were the sort of big themes I took, uh, took with me from, from yesterday. Yeah. But science, that's some more internal science making, but if you look at a more policy making perspective, 
Yeah, exactly. And I think we managed to move um, from the, the last session of yesterday, it was about citizen science, that was a perfect bridge into today. And that was, as, as you're pointing out, more leaning towards uh, policy, the interaction, the engagement, inviting everybody into the process. And we had some really good examples from, from many different uh, countries. So then I should mention that I, since you can confirm, but uh, all the sessions will be available afterwards online. Yeah, and I get the thumbs up. So uh, since there's been people coming and going over the different sessions and um, uh, this possibility will, will be online for the future. So we learned, for example, that MLE is not a, a female name. It's a <laughs> sort of mutual learning exercise. <laughs> I think uh, that's something actually to remember because that uh, uh, is something that uh, uh, the European Commission is, uh, is working on and was presenting yesterday that I think had some really concrete tips on how to move forward with citizen science. Um, and that would then be the, the bridge for today, where we focus on embedding open science in society. Uh, and the, the second half of today, where we've been talking about accessibility to and involvement in science. And there have been so many examples, I think, today from both uh, science centers and natural history museums. We heard Peter from uh, Copenhagen talking here about examples uh, from our neighboring countries. And I, I think that uh, uh, what we hear is something that we recognize and that we're challenged by the same um, uh, was it problems, but also that it is uh, uh, both science centers and natural history of today were really aware of the challenges and we had have a ter determination to contribute to the solutions and to be able to do that together as Sissi and then Bruno represented at the very last <laughs> sessions of today, how the European networks that is already existing, you see uh, Excite you were representing here, as the presidents, um, I think that also gives this um, hope for the future that I think we need after having a, a full two day of discussing, covering all these different topics. Yeah, I think hope for the future is a very good takeaway as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And do you see what's happened here? I think we have a word a cloud. <laughs> Maybe you've seen this for a while yeah. now, but we're standing too close to yeah. even see the cloud here. Kelter for that. Yeah. change what was you really say, no. Colin? I can't say culture change. That was really the word for yesterday. Uh, what what is needed to to make open science the norm? That with just science is open science, and uh, many of the speakers really put that culture change is the most important part and that takes time so I think that's a good takeaway we, the culture change takes time we need to have patience and we move moving forward so what do I, you I saw trust there and then yeah, it all changed yeah. but it, it was up and very green and big <laughs> for a moment there <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's a word that we heard a lot today uh, from yeah. the morning sessions right. mm -hmm. like the importance of trust and uh, to be able to be uh, build a, a, a great foundation for uh, the development of open science. It can also diverse career paths, and maybe that has to do with what we discussed also with that we need support for the researchers because it takes more time. That was someone really stated yesterday that, that because you have to keep track of your data, you have to really work very carefully with that. You need data scientists, you need people supporting uh, the open science uh, paradigm. So, so that, that's also important to say that there are different rules here. Mm. Very good. I feel that we've been chit chatting so long. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so what do you take so away? My, What's your take away? Oh, so the main takeaway. Uh, I got, so there, there are a few things. Actually, from today, I was thinking about the determination that the Austrian Federal Ministry uh, represented with their 10 points heading mm. towards the future. So I would like to revisit that actually and, and read over those 10 points you were mentioning before to think long term it's hmm. a that's how we would actually make things change and i i, I think by a 10 point program uh, from a, a federal ministry could actually uh, be a way forward i also thinking about axel verkander from the netherlands he said something that um, i don't know so i have so many notes with my, my <laughs> scribbling down but he said something along the lines of open science is not only 
making publications available free of charge. Like you said, yesterday we talked a lot about money, yeah. but it's not only about that, it's really also, and I think that's something for museums to th take as a home um, message, uh, is also making it understandable. So working on the science literacy. So things can be available, yes, check that box, but if we can't understand what it says, then we haven't achieved much anyhow. There will still just be circling around the researchers, which of course is a benefit of its own, and it will keep open science has a benefit, but we could widen that and make it more inclusive. So that would be two things. Two things, yeah. yeah. And, and, and I'm, I'm happy to share a third, but I... No, 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 I'm just, <laughs> well, I was make a sort of more overall takeaway. It's yeah. really that we're moving forward, I would say, and, uh, and that it's so important that we together policy, at the policy level uh, really agree and move forward together, because yeah. that will enable open science uh, for the researchers. So yes. that's what really I think, yeah, it's possible. Yes. Absolutely. I, I sort of have a vision of what Ellen Bruno was mentioning from the Stockholm uh, uh, University Baltic Sea Center. We yeah. used the term uh, knowledge brokers. I don't know, is, has that... Is that for now? You can write it in later. Because <laughs> I, mean, yeah. yeah. I think that was uh, quite inspirational. And she was pointing out also, uh, um, imagine that being a, a network that is all over Europe or, or globally and knowledge brokers that uh, I would love to have that on my CV. Okay, <laughs> it's a time to <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> wrap up. I, I think it is absolutely um, the right time to wrap up and we'll have a few uh, minutes to maybe uh, stand up and uh, talk to your neighbors and, and leave this room as you feel ready. And, uh, what's that? and then we have guided tours to offer, exactly. Mm, but I don't incredible. think we have a slide for that. But uh, what you can do is that you can have a coffee and have um, uh, and sit down for a bit. And then approximately quarter past, there will be guided tours offered uh, throughout the museum. So we'll divide into both spe Swedish-speaking groups and English-speaking groups. So I'm happy to yeah. invite you to that. And yeah, uh, you know, I would like to say thank you to everyone that's been here uh, on site today and yesterday. It has been lovely to host, uh, host this event. And also great thanks to the, ra to the rangers, <laughs> the those organizers who really got this program together. There were 12, 12 institutions working together. You really done a great job. So thank you, everyone. Yeah. I would and like to thank Bank and Jubileums Fund for supporting financially. So yeah. thank you, everybody. <laughs>